time right now is 6.01 p.m. And this meeting is hereby called to order. We have the presence of quorum attending in person. Notice of this meeting has been posted online and at the Fort Bend SD administration building for at least 72 hours. First, we have its national anthem performed by the Austin High School Ensemble. So thank you for being here. So please stand up. Thank you, Austin High School. That was beautiful and powerful. Thank you. So now please remain standing for a moment of silence. You may be seated. Yeah. Next, we have a recognition. So, Ms. Smith, I'm turning this over to you. Thank you. Now they're on? Okay, wonderful. Thank you for your patience during that little technical moment we had. Um, this evening, we would like to thank the Austin High School Small Press Ensemble, who performed the national anthem. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but we had uh, our, a mini director. I'm not sure uh, of his name, but um, uh, I'm going to assume that he is with our director, Mr. Adrian Caswell. And also members of the ensemble are Eli Clayton, Mark Hernandez, Nicholas Wynn, Cindy March, Grace Pugh, Sheridan Sapo, Sam Stewart, Chris Williams. And thank you all very much for that wonderful performance. <laughs>
Thank you all. Our next recognition, can, can everyone hear me? Okay, good, just making sure. Uh, 12 Fort Bend ISD students earned the Gold Seal Awards at the Visual Arts Scholastic event and named All-Star Artists. The state event is sponsored by the Texas Art Educator, Educators Association. The Gold Seal, Seal winners will have their artwork exhibited in a variety of venues across the state. Some students were not able to be here tonight, but we will recognize them. From Bush High School, we have Natalie Chavez, art teacher, Bonneth Ramos. Uh, from Clements High School, we have Chloe Donaldson, Sophia Flores, Caitlin Fraley, uh, Ting Yu Wendy Wu, Madeline Kofer, art teacher, Rebecca T. From Dulles High School, we have Yenin uh, G, art teacher, Kayla Matthews, Elkins High School, Grace Sowen Park, art teachers Ryan Morales, Ridge Point High School, April Massey, April received two gold seals, and Yvonne Gu, Yvonne also received two gold seals by art teacher Jenny Pham. For our last recognition, the Fort Bend ISD Theater Program has received an Outstanding District Award of Distinction from the Texas Educational Theater Association for their outstanding contributions in raising the standards for theater education in Texas as observed through achievement, curation of re resources, diversity, and advocacy in theater arts. Receiving this re recognition this evening is Dr. Director of Fine Arts, James Drew, and Assistant Director of Fine Arts for Theater and Dance, Travis Springfield. This concludes this evening's recognitions. This concludes this evening's recognitions. That's it.
<laughs> Next, we have superintendent update. I'm going to turn this over to you, Dr. Wayback. Thank you. Um, good evening, board, and uh, to our community. We'll start off with some uh, exciting things that have been going on across our district. Recently, the communications department hosted a community outreach breakfast for seniors in our community. It was a very productive morning, lots of information shared, insightful questions, and a very strong support for Fort Bend ISD. Our seniors enjoyed a full breakfast, good dialogue with district leaders, and some very nice door prizes you can see there, uh, donated by, <laughs> see the excitement there, winning the door prize, uh, donated by our community partners. And we have a lot more events scheduled uh, for these crucial stakeholders, so stay tuned if you're in our community and you're 62 and older. September Impact Award, Deanna Duran Alvarado is this month's Impact Award winner. She was selected for her unwavering dedication, loyalty, and top-notch performance for the past 19 years. She is also here with her, some of her communications friends and her husband and children. Her journey started as a paraprofessional, then an executive assistant, and she is now manager of events, customer service, and recognitions. She coordinates all the graduations, staff service awards, teacher of the year awards, just to name a few. So she is someone who is always behind the scenes, and I know our board has seen a lot of her, especially at graduations. So congratulations uh, to Deanna. And now for some big news, or should I say a big check, Rosa Parks Elementary was recently surprised with a $5,000 donation from Burlington Stores, which just opened a new location in Missouri City near the campus. The donation will help teachers and needed classroom supplies. So thank you, Burlington Stores, and Adopt a Classroom for supporting our teachers and students. AP Scholars, we want to congratulate students from Dulles, Elkins, and Ridgepoint High School who received AP Seminar and Research Certificates, which are earned by receiving a score of three or higher in both the AP Seminar and AP Research courses. Other students received the AP Capstone Diploma because not only did they ace the AP Seminar and AP Research courses, but they also made high scores on four other AP exams. So congratulations to these impressive students. Proud alumni, current and former staff, and district leaders recently gathered to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Clements High School. Clements opened its doors back in 1983, named for former Texas Governor William P. Clements. Sadly, as we all know, this 40-year-old campus is showing its age with some major structural issues, but a brand new building is on the way in a few years thanks to the voters who said yes on the 2023 bond in May. Voter registration. So speaking of voters, each year our high school students are provided at least two opportunities to register to vote while on campus. National Voter Registration Day is tomorrow, but at Elkins today they hosted a voter registration drive during all lunch periods. Students cheered on their peers who stepped up to register. As one of the administrators put it, students should see voting as a way to demonstrate their leadership abilities as young adults. Campuses across our district are encouraging students to register, and we remind our entire community to get informed, get registered, and to go vote on November 7th, or as soon as early voting opens on October 23rd. And as you know, Fort Bend ISD has Proposition A on the ballot. The Texas Association of School Administrators and Texas Association of School Boards have announced the projects that will be included in their next exhibit of school architecture. We're pleased to announce that our very own Lakeview Elementary, designed by Kirksey Architecture, has received two stars of distinction for design and value. Architectural firms were selected for new build and renovation projects all across the state. And the exciting part about this is not only is this Lakeview, but this will be the future design for Briargate. The Fort Bend ISD Facilities Department recently held its fifth annual tailgate party. It was a great event and allowed coworkers to have a good time together and to know that they are appreciated. Food trucks, music, awesome prizes. Mr. Veltz, it looks like your team definitely knows how to throw a party and to enjoy each other. Thanks for always choosing to care and to making your employees feel valued because they definitely are. And then in closing, lastly, Hispanic Heritage Month. 
began Friday. And as one of the most diverse districts in the nation, we recognize and value the many cultures our families represent. So throughout the next month, campuses will hold special events and activities to educate and celebrate the Hispanic culture in our community. Thank you, President Day. Thank you, Dr. Rayback. I'm sure we all appreciate the updates. Next, we have board activity report, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> For the board members district activities report, we have meeting to draft student achievement calendar, special called meeting superintendent evaluation review, fall open houses at various campuses, special called meeting VATRE allocation planning workshop, special called meeting VATRE allocation vote meeting, Clemens High School 40 year anniversary celebration, coffee and conversations, active seniors 62 plus breakfast, shack meeting, meeting to discuss 2023-24 student code of conduct, orientation to the Texas Education Code, update to the Texas Ex Education Code, Fort Bend Education Foundation back to school scramble golf tournament, board policy committee meeting, monthly one-to-one -one meetings with the superintendent, special called meeting, board and superintendent goal setting, the future of education with TEA Commissioner Mike Morath, grand opening Burlington, Missouri, Missouri City, various varsity football games, Student Achievement Committee, Student Leadership 101, Session 1, Meeting to Discuss Student Outcomes Calendar, Special Called Meeting, Team Building Slash Board Training, Astros Game with National University, Vietnam Cultural Festival, Fort Bend County Student Leadership Meeting, TEA Gifted and Talented Program Update Meeting, the Friends of Sugarland 95 Meeting, and last but not least, Destination Imagination Executive Board Meeting. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. The board has been really working really hard. So next is uh, public comments. Tonight we have five speakers. The board encourages and welcome comments and input from our patrons. Please limit your comments to three minutes and please refrain from mentioning a student or employee's name when voicing a concern or complaint as board policy provides alternative procedures through the grievance process policies, GF local or DGBA local to seek resolution to complaints. I will rate the name of the person registered to speak and share they have three minutes to make their comments. Once the speaker starts their comments, the board secretary, Ms. David Hamilton, will announce when they have 30 seconds remaining. Once the three minutes time limit has expired and whether the speaker has concluded their comments, Mr. Hamilton will announce that the speaker's time has elapsed and then ask you return to your seat. The first speaker of tonight is Ms. Eva Frazier. Thank you, ma'am, for coming tonight. Good evening. I am a Fort Bend ISD parent, and I have well over a decade invested in our district. I believe our district's diversity is one of our superpowers. However, today, I'm here to speak about problems with racial bias within the Fort Bend ISD school system as it relates to handling and investigating disciplinary actions for our minority students, especially our brown and black boys and young men. Statistics show that the black and brown boys make up about 50% of Fort Bend ISD district's population, but account for about 90% of the population at the district's alternative school. When you compile these stats with interviews of parents of black and brown boys in the district and their experiences, alarm bells go off. I have personal knowledge of at least 10 parents in Fort Bend ISD with brown and black boys that have had issues with false accusations made against their child or were not aware of all of the de details that were actual, that actually went into their child's disciplinary report or just felt administration was not being objective when investigating matters or concerning their child. Keep in mind, racial bias can occur by anyone, including other black and brown teachers and administrators. Racial biases can be unconscious or conscious actions, and racial biases can cause irreversible damage to our students and create a toxic environment in our school. 
I have some suggestions. Here are some ideas. Investigations into disputed facts should be objective, thorough, and unbiased. Any investigations involving a student or witness should be recorded from beginning to end to preserve evidence, especially when a parent or guardian is not present and accounts of the events are disputed. Secondly, the severity of the punishment should fit the nature of the incident. There are known patterns of some administrator teachers exercising the most severe consequences to minority students without hesitation. A disciplinary board should be kept separate from the school handling the actual investigation. This will ensure a system of checks and balances as in objectivity. Thirdly, all information put into a disciplinary report should be immediately disclosed to every parent or guardian verbatim to ensure the details within a report are consistent. A parent or guardian should not be made to wait until the report is available with the public records. The delays could compromise the parents being able to conduct their own investigation. Fourth, dis disciplinary actions should be taken against any teacher or administrator that makes false allegations against a student, intentionally omits, delays, or falsifies information in a student's disciplinary 30 seconds. or campus report or is involved in any coercion of a student or witness's statement. Any teacher or administration proven to have this type of behavior should be banned from dealing with disciplinary actions at all. I strongly believe implementing these measures can deter or minimize the practice of racial bias. I believe this type of transparency would benefit all parties involved, including of the majority of the teachers and administrators that are sincerely trying to do the right thing. We can no longer turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to discriminatory Time. disciplinary practices in Fort Bend ISD. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Next, we have Mr. Adil Akhtar. Thank you, sir, for coming tonight. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I'm here to ask you to vote against rewarding the contract for long-term planning consultant to HPM. There are two critical reasons why we are better served as a district to send the RFP back out for a bid again than to award this contract to HPM. The firm was selected and brought forth for your vote tonight for one of two reasons. A, the qualifications of the firm itself, or B, the past relationship the district has with one of its recently hired executives Mr. Scott Leopold. But both of these scenarios present problems in my opinion, and here's why. If HPM was selected due to its qualifications as a firm, we really need to look into why. Because HPM doesn't meet at least 90% of what our district RFP was requiring and asking for. I actually have the RFP summary right here in my hands. I'm gonna read directly from it. So let me read it. Uh, within it, it says, we were looking for a well-established educational consulting firm with experience. And actually, I'm going to start right there because um, HPM is not an educational consulting firm at all. Uh, it goes on experience in providing services specific to boundary planning, analyzing and performing school enrollment, also a firm that can study uh, impact on educational opportunities, charter private school impact, historical boundary changes. HPM doesn't do any of this. They never have. And anyone can do deep research in HPM and see that they are a construction management firm focused primarily on new construction for private companies. So based on that, it's my assumption that, be, that uh, HPM was pri primarily be, uh, selected based on the relationship that Mr. Leopold has with our district. But based on the track record under his watch, I hope we can agree that it would not be prudent to work with Mr. Leopold again. And let me share where we stand today directly due to the poor planning under Mr. Leopold. 24 of our elementary schools are underutilized. That's 46%. 16 of them are at 65% of capacity and falling. And he continued to recommend building brand new schools around many of these relatively empty campuses. That is a major waste of taxpayer money. Eight of 50 middle schools, more than half are underutilized. And between 2015 and 2020, at least six con new constructions opened above design capacity. So how bad is our planning that our brand new buildings are open, overcrowded seconds. and over congested uh, with our with district, uh, when other districts build them far under capacity to allow for future growth. That's how you're supposed to do it. So in closing, boundary planning is a single biggest hot button issue and it really doesn't need to be. 
It erodes community with uh, to ISD trust, creates a bad experience for families, teachers, and everyone in this room. Tonight, we have a unique opportunity to make a big change and show Fort Bend ISD families that we're moving towards a new future. Thank you. Time. Thank you for coming tonight. Next, we have Dr. Stephanie Ellis. Thank you for coming tonight. Hi, thank you for having me again. I'm Dr. Stephanie Ellis, a Fort Bend parent, a psychologist and president of the Fort Bend Psychological Association. I'm here to talk about starting high school at 8.30 or later, a change that many districts have made because of how many benefits it has. It improves academics, graduation rates, physical health, mental health, classroom discipline, juvenile delinquency, and student and community safety. So what's holding us back? People's most common concerns seem not to be supported by the research or the experience of districts who've already made the change. So let me address a few. If we move start times later, teens will stay up later. They don't. Bedtimes stay the same and virtually every extra minute teens are given in the morning is spent sleeping in every study. But changing the bus schedules is unmanageable and expensive. There's at least two ways to make this relatively easy and free, start high school after middle school or swap high school and elementary times. But if we change elementary schools to start earlier, our little ones will be in danger waiting for the bus in the dark. First, teens are three times more likely to be in vehicle pedestrian accidents than elementary students and four times as likely to be abducted by strangers. Also, parent volunteers tend to be happy to wait with their littles for the bus, but nobody seems to want to wait with teens who are in more danger right now. But it'll make traffic bad. No, it won't. Research doesn't bear that out anywhere. And if HISD didn't have a problem in 2018, we're not going to have a problem either. But sports schedules are going to get messed up. Nope. This works in every district that has done it. And if we change now, we'll be in the middle of the pack in terms of nearby districts. But teens need to work after school. First, not that many teens in Fort Bend need to work to support their families, but those who do can get waivers. We already do that for college dual enrollment teens. And low-income students are the ones who benefit the most academically from starting high school later. Also, teens can still work after school. Wherever this change is made, communities and businesses adjust without disaster. But who will watch their young siblings after school? Luckily, virtually every elementary school in Fort Bend ISD already has optional after school care, so no issue there. You do not want teens at home between 2 and 6 p.m. Weekdays, unsupervised, after school is when they're most likely to drink, seconds. do drugs, get pregnant, and commit crimes. But we need to prepare them for the real world. We do. So, 725. <laughs> and college doesn't either. And colleges are beginning to eliminate the 8 a.m. class because students underperform in 8 a.m. classes so much compared to 9 a.m. classes. So this is doable. Y'all, if HISD can do it, Fort Bend ISD can do it. And if you have any other concerns, let me know. I will email you Time. or I'll come back next month. Thank you. Thank you for coming to speak tonight. Next, we have Sharon Thompson. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings, members of the board from the suburban Houston Fort Bend alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and our president, Jackie Smith. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated was founded in 1913 on the campus of Howard University to promote academic excellence, provide support to the underserved, and educate and stimulate participation in the establishment of positive public policy. Today, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated has chartered, chap has chartered 1,058 chapters worldwide and has initiated more than 350,000 members since its founding. The sorority boldly confronts the challenges that faced all Americans, including those of African descent, through its five programmatic thrusts, economic development, educational development, international awareness and involvement, physical and mental health, and political awareness and involvement. Our sorority convenes annually for Delta Days in the state's capital, and during this event, we meet with our members of legislature and share our state legislative priorities. 
Part of these state legislative priorities include advocating that all students should have equal access to high quality education, regardless of their background or circumstances. This means that students should have access to the same resources and opportunities, regardless of their race, ethnicity, economic status, gender, or any other characteristics. Additionally, all students should have access to the same education standards, curricula, assessments, and should receive the same level of support from their teachers and administrators. Where gaps exist in quality of education, resources, or outcomes, there must be an intentional strategy to address deficiencies. We're speaking today to ask that you Board of Trustees and subcommittees continue to gather meaningful, high quality data and actively review this data to guide policy improvements and program implementation in Fort Bend ISD. We look forward to attending future meetings to see how the Fort Bend ISD Board intends to progress with data collected and ensure that our children are educated in safe, up-to-date, and well-equipped school facilities. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Next, we have Jay Jenkins. Thank you, sir, for coming tonight. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jay Jenkins, and I'm the president of the Convict Leasing and Labor Project, a nonprofit that I co-founded with my good friend, the late Reginald Moore. I spoke at last month's meeting following the district's announcement of their intentions to build an elementary school on land that dates back to Fort Bend County and Sugar Land's largest forced labor camp, the Harlem Prison Farm. Subsequently, the district has announced plans to turn the Ellis Camp Cemetery, the historically accurate name for the site where the Sugar Land 95 were discovered and not the Bullhead Camp Cemetery, into a memorial of sorts. The only issue here, we do not know who we are memorializing. Despite many promises made over the years to expedite DNA testing that would definitively identify the Sugar Land 95 and their descendants, the district has instead chosen to spend its money on artistic renderings of a park built around an incorrectly named cemetery filled with headstones reading unknown. Is this how the district who purchased both tracts of land at a discount repays the Sugar Land 95 and their descendants for the sweat equity those individuals accrued while being tortured, maimed, and killed for profit by sprucing up unmarked headstones without actually identifying those whose remains the district dug up and let sit in the hot summer sun for months in 2019? It's hard not to see the connection between the timing of the announcement that Fort Bend ISD would be constructing an elementary school on what was perhaps the county's most infamous work farm, the Harlem Farm, and the announcement of a memorial on the Sugar Land 95 site in the following weeks. The memorial announcement came as the community awaits any indication that the, the district is taking seriously the possibility of uncovering yet another concentration camp cemetery at the elementary school site in the Harvest Green community. Ownership of attractive land is not ownership of the history of land, nor is it ownership of the individuals who perished on that land. The very public failure to identify descendants of the Sugar Land 95 over five years after the district discovered and removed their remains from the ground is an abject moral failure and no amount of artistic renderings will change that. CLP and the community will continue to fight for the dignity of those tortured to death for profit across Fort Bend County, whose history cannot and should not be reduced to headstones that say unidentified. Visitors to the district's current Sugar Land 95 exhibit now receive a pair of dice as representation of the history of that site. Aside from the obvious questions about how providing visitors with dice captures in any way the historical significance of the site, we hope the district does not continue to roll the dice in hopes they don't accidentally dig up more bodies. The community will not forget about the sweat equity those buried at Ellis Camp Cemetery built up, about the fact that the entire county is dotted with forced labor camps and potentially unmarked cemeteries, and how much differently the district reacted when my friend Reggie was alive and attempting to raise awareness of this bloody racist history at the foundation of the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming tonight. That concludes our uh, public comments. So now we will now convene in closed session under Texas Open Meeting Act. Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, under the following sections. Section 551071, for the purpose of a private consultation with the board attorney on any or all subjects of matters authorized by law. Section 551072, consider purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. Section 551074, personnel matters. Section 551076, security matters. 
Section 551A2, Student Discipline Matters or Complaint, or Section 551A21, Personally Identifiable Information about Public School Students. The time now is 6.36, and we are now convened in closed session. The, this part of the meeting will roughly last 40 to 45 minutes. Thank you. Now it's 7.25 p.m., and we are now reconvened in open session. Do we have a motion from closed session? Yes, Madam President. <clears throat> I move that the Board of Trustees accept the hearing officer's recommendation concerning the Level 3 FNG grievance of Eva Frazier. Second. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Hamilton and second by Ms. Hannon. Do we have a discussion? Seeing none, please vote. Motion passes 7 all. Next on the agenda is information item. Dr. Wayback, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you. Actually, I'm just going to turn it right over to Dr. Lawson and the academic team. Fantastic. Good evening, uh, President Day, board members, Superintendent Whitbeck. We're elated to be here tonight. Academic Affairs is uh, sharing a presentation. It's our first uh, presentation based on the Student Achievement Committee. So again, thanks to Ms. Hannon and the committee for uh, bringing forward um, an opportunity to talk about student outcomes. Our first session tonight is led by Melissa Hubbard, our Executive Director for Teaching and Learning. She's worked with the team as well as a couple of our campuses to share our end of year data from the 2022-2023 school year. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Melissa Hubbard. All right, we have a little technical delay here. We'll go ahead and get that resent over to for technology. I don't know if we want to proceed, Miss Day, with the safety update, but it looks as if the presentation's not ready to go. Yes, definitely we can do that. So, Chief Ryder, would you like to make a safety update to the community and to the board? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well, good evening, President Day, board members, and Dr. Whitbeck. The, uh, the mission of the Fort Bend ISD Police Department is to provide a safe environment in and around our schools and district facilities while serving as educators and building positive relationships with our students, our staff, and our families. We practice an educator first mentality, which means we have an opportunity to educate students every day, not necessarily in a classroom, but by the way we walk down the halls, by the way we interact with students. Um, we don't have to be in a classroom to be an educator. So this presentation is an opportunity to educate parents and the community on who we are and what we do. In the Fort Bend ISD Police Department, we have 76 sworn police officers. Two are assigned to high schools, one assigned to each middle school, and 11 assigned to elementary school patrol. We have investigators assigned to person and property crimes, child abuse, and computer forensics. We operate a dispatch center 24 hours a day, seven days a week where they can answer calls as well as monitor alarms and security cameras at any time. <clears throat> we employ roughly 160 crossing guards that help our students cross streets safely every day. We have a life safety systems department where technicians oversee, install, and repair intrusion alarms and fire alarm systems, card access, security cameras, and fire extinguisher services. We also have emergency management. And they ensure compliance with state mandates, safety audits, staff trainings, and oversight of all emergency drills. Fort Bend ISD Police Department is an accredited and recognized agency through the Texas Police Chiefs Association Best Practices Recognition Program. We voluntarily work in compliance with approximately 180 Texas law enforcement best practices. 
These best practices were developed by Texas law enforcement professionals to assist agencies in the efficient and effective the reduction of risk and the protection of individuals' rights. We were originally recognized in 2016 after a complete review of our general orders manual, a site visit from assessors, and interviews with staff. While we submit proof submissions on a yearly basis to demonstrate ongoing compliance, complete site visit reviews are conducted on a four-year cycle, which then establishes a re-recognized milestone. We were re-recognized in 2020, and we're preparing for the second re-recognition in 2024. We compiled a safety and security master plan in 2014 with community input, where we had several meetings at schools with the community. This safety and security master plan was designed to be a roadmap for future planning of the district's safety and security needs. The plan is based on four interrelated elements, which are infrastructure, crisis communication and notification, staffing, and policies and procedures. Many of the safety and security measures in that original plan in 2014 were funded by bond 2014, such as security vestibules, window film, security camera upgrades, and card access control, to name a few. The safety and security master plan was again updated in 2018 ahead of the bond with the help of a safety advisory committee. That safety advisory committee was made up of 45 community stakeholders, which was co-led by a former Houston police officer and a retired Fort Bend ISD teacher. Their charge was to explore safety solutions that may be added to the safety and security master plan, thus enhancing the security measures already in place. The committee explored 14 potential new safety strategies and reached consensus that 12 of them should be recommended to the Board of Trustees, while two of them should not be recommended. Those strategies included an emergency operations center, which has been completed, a threat management program, which has been completed, incident reporting platform for students and staff, completed, door locks, completed, police officers for a threat assessment team, completed, police officer to investigate child abuse cases, completed, police officers to patrol elementary campuses, completed, training for students and staff, completed and continuing, metal detectors, we're doing a pilot program for athletic venues, fencing around portable buildings, in progress, staff and student ID badges, in progress, a school marshal program was not implemented, allow approved staff to carry firearms that was not recommended by the, by the committee, and facial recognition software was also not recommended by the committee to move forward. The safety and security master plan is posted on the Fort Bend ISD police website for stakeholders to view. As far as state mandates go, numerous state mandates also drive activity in our police department. Our district has a emergency operation plan that's reviewed annually and approved by the Texas School Safety Center. Our active threat annex and active shooter appendix were approved by the Texas School Safety Center last school year as well. We conduct legislatively required campus safety audits. We just completed the three-year cycle of audits, which was recently reported to the superintendent, the board of trustees, and the Texas School Safety Center. We've convened a school safety and security committee that's required to meet at least three times per year to discuss safety-related topics for the district. The committee is comprised of board members, the superintendent, staff, parents, and local first responders. State-mandated intruder detection audits were also conducted. Last school year, Fort Bend ISD had 62 unannounced campus audits by Region 4 personnel, which resulted in only four campuses with a finding where doors into a school were found unlocked. Those were reported to the board at regular board meetings by myself and reported to the School Safety and Security Committee. House Bill 3, in part, also mandates an armed commissioned police officer at every campus during regular school hours, which the board will address later this, this evening. Fort Bend ISD has 50 elementary schools. As far as training, Fort Bend ISD police is active in training students, staff, our community, and our officers. Standard response protocol has been in use for approximately 10 years. This is plain language to direct students, staff, and visitors on what to do in any type of emergency on a campus. <clears throat> we also subscribe to the alert training. And that's the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training, or Active Shooter Training. All Fort Bend ISD police officers complete this training yearly. 
Fort Bend ISD also has trained alert instructors, and we partner with other instructors in Fort Bend County to host training classes. We hosted 16 alert training classes this past school year with over 350 police officers from all over the country taking our training. Officers are required to take mandatory school-based law enforcement training classes as well. Topics include working with juveniles, de-escalation techniques, crisis intervention techniques, and understanding the adolescent brain. Stakeholder training is also important to us. We have instructors for the CRAZE curriculum, which is the civilian response to active shooter events. We have instructors that teach this class to staff and community organizations alike. We are governed by policies and procedures. Our police department uh, is governed by the, our police department's general orders manual. That is also reviewed annually as part of our recognized status uh, that I mentioned earlier. We're also governed by district policy under the CK section. We strive to work with all stakeholders collaboratively and build strong relationships. We want our students, staff, and parents to feel safe in our schools, and we provide them with different options to report a crime or anything suspicious. This school year, students and parents alike have done a good job reporting crimes or suspicious activity directly to the police department as opposed to simply posting on social media. This significantly speeds up our response time to a potentially critical situation. We've developed a See Something, Share Something app. It's specifically for Fort Bend ISD, and it allows anyone to report something directly to Fort Bend ISD police anonymously. Crime Stoppers is always another good way to report something anonymously. And of course, anyone can report anything directly to our police department and our officers by calling Fort Bend ISD Police Dispatch or when you see an officer on a campus. While police officers and uniforms may be the first image that comes to mind when talking about the Fort Bend ISD Police Department, we serve the district in a variety of ways with numerous employees who embrace the idea, idea of being educators first and building positive relationships. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chief Ryder. I'm going to open for the board to ask questions. Do we have any questions? Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Chief Ryder, for that update. Uh, so I think it's worth reiterating. Can you say that again? So if, if a student or a, a parent becomes aware of some kind of a threat, should they post first on social media or should they report to you first, to the, your department? Well, thank you for that softball question. Please <laughs> report it directly to the police department and not on social media. It allows us to respond much quicker. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. I, I do want to commend the students and parents who did that. Uh, so that, that uh, made a big difference in the, the incidents recently on the campus. Uh, and also commend uh, Chief Ryder and, and Mr. Roseburr and, and the staff uh, who did a great job responding quickly and taking these things seriously uh, so that we didn't have a, a bad incident. Uh, so thank you for your diligence and, and for keeping our kids and, and our employees safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Ms. Malone. Yes, thank you, President Day. And thank you, Chief Ryder, for um, the update. <clears throat> Greatly appreciate it. And I think um, most notably for me is the see something, share something, which we talked about years past. And I recall a teacher not even like coming to us about a concern and not even being aware of the app. And so it um, brings me great, great joy and also just comfort knowing that the word is spreading and that not only are our staff more familiar, but also our students and that they're utilizing it. And so my ask would be of you is if we could possibly get some data on that to know how much it's increased year over year. Um, I think that's really helpful to know because being able to attribute that with the marketing efforts that were done last year. I, like I recall seeing the posters up at mm -hmm. campuses and so forth. And I know that in, in assemblies that principals have um, really been conveying that message to utilize this app. And so if we've seen such tremendous results, if it's, you know, just knowing that um, I guess there's, if there's additional gain that we could seek and what we can do to support those efforts. And I, Thank you very much for um, for you spearheading that and having that vision some years ago and now seeing it in fruition and making a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malone. Ms. Jones. Thank you, Chief Ryder. Um, I'm, I always feel safe. Even when I'm here, I always feel <laughs> safe with uh, Fort Ben ISD police. And I just commend you because 
I know that you don't see, we don't see what you see every day. And sometimes it's not always positive, but I just wanted to let you know that we do appreciate you and we do support you. And I just have one little question. <laughs> what message can you provide to parents that would reassure them that their child is safe in our schools? <clears throat> what do you want parents to know? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I think that, that our school district puts more um, intentional effort uh, behind making our schools safe, I will say that schools are the safest place to be in our community. Okay. And, and, and the reason I say that is we have a layered approach. When you look at our safety and security master plan, we have a layered approach to security. It's not just the physical part. There's a, there are a whole number of, of security measures that keep our schools safe. And, and I would challenge anybody to look at where, other, where kids could go in our community that does not have the, the that would not have the number of safety measures that we have in place. For instance, security vestibules, window film, officers on site, door locks, um, just to name a few. Security cameras. There are some places that where our kids might go to the mall, to the movie theater, to a restaurant, where those places might have one or two of those security measures. But our district puts a lot of intentional effort into making sure that we, we do as much as we can to protect our students. And, and I would say that our schools are probably the safest place for our kids to be in our community. Thank you, Chief Ryder. And parents, your babies are safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Um, Chief, good job, as always. I know we, we have many conversations, and I still... Um, going to schedule that tour to go uh, see the uh, uh, police department. I know I missed it last year. Um, one of the things that I always look at when I see incidents come in is I always look at response time. And when I see when an incident occurs, if it's a fire drill or, you know, something, and it's not always, it, it's, it, it takes a team effort. So it's not just, you know, the police, it's also the, the, the campus and the teachers and, and the principals making sure that everybody's doing what they need to do. So from the time a, a fire alarm goes off or there's a medical hold or something like that, and then we have to clear the halls or we have to go outside, and how long does it take for us to do all these things? And um, I just want to say thank you for, for all y'all do, for sure. Thanks to the teachers and the staff for all they do. I've got um, uh, one in middle school, one in high school, and and I've said it before, I'll just keep saying it again, you know, I, I we've had... Um, the threats at the schools, and we've had parents afraid to send their their kids to school the next day. And I've never I've never felt like I needed to do that. Um, I've always sent my kids, uh, just told them to just see something, say something. We always try to push that app. And I think um, with uh, Trustee Malone, some usage data would be nice just to see what what we're doing, what what's working. So, um, uh, yeah, no, thank you very much, and thanks to everybody that's uh, making this a, a group effort. I appreciate you saying that, and I do want to reiterate, it is a total team effort. We we could not have safe schools with just a police department, right? I mean, it is truly the teachers, the administrators, the students, the parents. Uh, we rely on everybody to keep our schools safe. It, it, it's a community effort, so thank you for that. Dr. Gilliam? Thank you, and I'm going to choose my words very carefully. Um, and when we go out, uh, thank you, Chief, for all of the information that you've given us. But we're so much better when we know things that are out in the community. So I really want to throw that out. And if you can talk to us a little bit about how it helps us when our students, when our parents, when there are things that are out there that are going on, that we know about that so we can do exactly everything that, that has been shared today. But we really need the community's help. We really, truly do. It's, it's not just us. We all got to work together. If you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, and thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> it is important for um, for our community to report things to us, even if they don't report it directly to the Fort Ben ISD Police Department. It could be Missouri City Police. It could be Sugarland Police. It could be the Sheriff's Department. It could be the constables. Uh, I, I will tell you that we meet uh, the the heads of each of those departments and their command staff. We meet once a week, 
and we have opportunities to talk in the dialogue. And so we're, we're a very tight-knit group, uh, which you don't find in a lot of communities. So I'm very proud of the fact that, that, we're, that, that our law enforcement is a tight-knit group here. Um, and so wherever they feel comfortable repeating uh, or reporting things that they hear in the community, um, that's going to benefit all of us from a community standpoint. So I'm glad you said that. Thank you, Dr. Gilliam. Um, Chief Ryder, can I ask a question? So um, I have people asking, you mentioned the camera. So do we have cameras by the, at the parking lot where, you know, when parents pick up their kids and, you know, do we have the, the cameras over there? We do have some cameras in parking lots, um, yes. And so as part of that, those were put in as part of the 2014 bond. Um, as you know, we've had uh, a number of cameras go out because we skipped a, a bond cycle where we thought we were going to replace cameras. Um, so as the parking lot cameras go out and an interior camera goes out, uh, we feel like replacing the interior cameras is probably more of a priority than the parking lot camera. So uh, there's probably more parking lot cameras that are out than we would like, uh, but that doesn't mean they're all out. So. Just remember, that doesn't mean they're all out. <laughs> we still have some parking lot cameras. So, um, but, but with the passage of this past bond, right, with the 23 bond, we have an opportunity now to go back and replace and, and catch back up on those. So I guess we probably have a monitor system like which one is out and the schedule for replacement. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then, um, the last thing I wanted to ask, you you provide a lot of information tonight, and I'm just wondering if um, you have this presentation, do you, do you think it's okay if maybe you can share those with the community in a way maybe we can attach to, to the board meeting agenda item uh, so the community member can have an opportunity to read what you just told everyone? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Ms. Malo. Yes, one more question. Sure. So I don't remember exactly what it's called, but I remember you guys started working on it some months ago in the Target parking lot. Um, the police force was there, and y'all were preparing gifts for this coming Christmas. The shop with a cop. Shop with a cop. Thank mm -hmm. you. And so since you're doing your presentation, <laughs> I think this would be a good ending is all of the good that you guys do, not only to keep our children safe in the community, but also to give them gifts at Christmas and um, just providing that fun and love. And can you share how folks can support this effort as well? So just like Ms. Day was mentioning the information on the parents and the stats for the things you're doing in your department, but also how you guys are going above and beyond and how people in our community can support financially this effort for kids to get to shop with a cop. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. We actually have two, so I'm going to plug two now that I have uh, a little time. Um, we, have, uh, we feed families at Thanksgiving as well. We partner with HEB, and a number of our officers um, will go and stuff police cars with full meals uh, for Thanksgiving um, and take those to uh, families that, that can use those. Uh, we've done that for many years. Um, and then Shop With a Cop uh, is through Target uh, and the Missouri City Police Department. We partner with them. Um, and, and those, um, if anybody wants to give to that, they can contact Target in Missouri City um, and donate to that. I believe they've got, a, um, I believe they've got some, uh, some avenues now to donate online. Um, and maybe we can put that on our website or something um, as, as we're talking about that and I'm thinking it through. Um, but what we do with Shop With a Cop, um, we have Fort Bend ISD uh, elementary students that are identified through their schools and they're invited to come to Target and they're each given a gift card um, and police officers, uh, Missouri City and Fort Bend ISD officers go there on a Saturday morning and walk with those students through the aisles and they get to shop and use up their gift cards. And so they get a lot of uh, presents and, and things like that at Christmas that they probably wouldn't normally get. So it's, a, it's an amazing morning every year. And if I recall from um, speaking with those officers, a lot of times they even go out of their own, like, dig into their own pockets to yeah, help these kids. We don't leave any money on the gift cards. We make sure that they spend it all and then some. Mm -hmm. 
So, well, thank you for that. I just think it's really important that the public understands that our police officers have hearts of gold and that it goes beyond the day-to-day, -day, um, Monday through Friday class week. So thank you. Thank you. And please support, guys. Please, 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 let's um, donate and make this the best year for Shop with a Cop. Thank you, Ms. Malone. Thank you, Chief Ryder. And we're going to move on to the next information item. Um, before we move on to the next information item, Ms. Hannon will make some statement from the Student Achievement Committee. Thank you. And um, it, uh, my fellow trustees, if you'll recall, at the last meeting, we um, gave you a draft uh, copy of the uh, FBISD Board of Trustees Commitment to Student Outcomes. And uh, it's my understanding that Ms. Jones, Ms. Malone, and myself, we did not get any um, feedback from you. So we are going to move forward with this as our, our commitment statement. And I'm going to read it very quickly. We aren't going to read it every time, but our committee does want our public to understand that we are committed to looking at our student data. And we had, we had some folks come in this, this um, during public session asking us, to be looking at our, our data of our students. So I'm gonna read it uh, once and you guys be prepared because there may be a time where I call on somebody to read it at another meeting before we look at student outcomes. So be prepared. I think you're next. Fort Bend ISD board commits to monitoring student data regularly during publicly scheduled board meetings with a particular focus on understanding the underlying factors influencing student achievement. When monitoring student data, the board commits to a vision of high expectations for teaching and learning and keeps the best interest of all students and the success of the district in the forefront. The board will support and collaborate with the superintendent to monitor student outcomes and use it to drive continuous improvement. The Texas Association of School Board writes, it takes a team of intentional trustees working with a focused superintendent an effective instructional team to improve student learning in the district. Teachers alone can't do it. Administrators can't do it alone. And school boards can't do it alone. Everyone from the boardroom to the classroom must be focused and intentional when it comes to improving student learning. Being focused means the board's eyes and thoughts are always on the goal. The goal always centers on the students. No matter what comes up, the board never loses sight of what is best for students. Being intentional means strategically taking steps toward the goal, pushing forward at the right pace for long-term success, measuring the health of the team and the progress being made. Setting student learning as the priority in the board's work requires developing a board culture and structure that support and focus. Fort Bend ISD school board members commit to being focused and intentional in our duties to monitor student data, to elevate outcomes for students, campuses, and the entire district. Thank you, Ms. Day. Thank you, Ms. Hannon. So now we are we ready for the information item? Okay. Please, Ms. Hubbard. Thank you, Ms. Day. Um, well, good evening, um, President Day, Dr. Whitbeck, and fellow Board of Trustee members. Um, this evening, I have the opportunity to share with you um, some student achievement data from the end of the year, spring 2023, for elementary. And so that's what we're going to focus our time on um, this evening. So I just briefly want to take a moment to explain just some elements of a balanced assessment framework in general um, that our district um, subscribes to and that we implement in our classrooms. And so what you'll notice is that we have various types of assessments that we offer in the district and those types of assessments give us different information. And we use those assessment items based on the data that they provide to us. And so um, one of those components of the balanced assessment framework is our universal screening and diagnostic assessments. So when we think about Renaissance 360, Tex-Kia, um, Circle, those are all 
parts of the diagnostic assessment system, and that gives us information about student learning and the, their skills um, related to grade level um, content, um, not TEKS necessarily, but the skills that are related to those grade level um, outcomes. And we utilize that data three times a year. So we get um, beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of year data. And that helps us to progress monitor students and measure student growth throughout the year. We also provide formative assessments, and those are a lot of our formative assessments come directly from our classroom teachers. They are determined in PLCs. Cam uh, campuses administer those formative assessments, and that's the kind of the linchpin or the best type of formative assessment that impacts day to day to instruction because. When a campus um, teacher administers that formative assessment, they're able to use that information and make an immediate instructional decision and determine what those um, adjustments to instruction might need to be. We also have different summative assessments. And if you think about that in terms of it is a summation or a culmination of um, an assessment after learning has occurred. So just having an understanding of mastery of the content. That's what we kind of think about related to summative assessments. And so STAR, STAR data is one of those metrics. Um, as well as classroom tests, tests that they might give at the end of a unit of instruction. Um, we also think about advanced placement tests, AP, as kind of that summative at the end of the course. And then another piece or component is programmatic assessments. And these are assessments that we give students to determine programming needs. So GT, um, or if they might reclassify and no longer need um, ESL um, programming, that's another type of assessment program. And the reason I felt it was important for us to kind of get a picture of the different types of assessments is because one data point doesn't tell a story of a student. We use in the district all of these different types of data points to make instructional decisions and programmatic decisions. Today, we're gonna focus strictly on the end of the year data as it relates to the universal screener and diagnostic assessments. So we're gonna be focusing specifically on REN 360, TexKia, Circle, BAS, and SEL. Those are our internal metrics that we've defined in our framework. Um, STAR is not going to be part of our discussion this evening because some of those results are still preliminary and we're waiting on some of the official information from the state. What I do want to make sure that we're aware of is how do we use this data? So I said we give a bunch of different types of assessment, and those give us different types of information, and we use it holistically. So at the campus, when we think about the use of end-of-year data, um, I'm sure you've reviewed our campus CIPs, campus improvement plans, before, and you probably noticed that they have SMART goals written in there that are specific to their Renaissance 360 data or they may have data in there related to their BAS. So they're using these data points as part of their campus improvement planning, and we use them as part of our district improvement planning process. What we do at the end of the year is we look at the, these data metrics and we determine if we've met our goals that we've set related to the, their CIPs or their the district improvement plan. If we've met our goals and we try to um, attribute that to some of the successes that we've had in those strategies. And when we don't meet our goals, then we, went, then we focus in on what actions or strategies do we need to employ in order to achieve those goals. We also use this information at the campus level in order to measure growth of our students that are in those tier three intervention systems to see if our students are accelerating growth. And it helps us to identify at the campus level um, students that might need immediate tier three intervention the minute school starts the next year. We also use this at the district level in order to design professional learning for teachers. What is the data telling us? Or if we need to make adjustments to our curriculum. 
We also use the district data in order to allocate itinerant staff to campuses that might have higher needs. So let's jump into the data a little bit. So what we're starting with here is our literacy data, BAS SEL. Um, this test is an individually administered assessment. That means the kiddo is sitting with their teacher and they're reading together and the teacher's observing the reading behaviors and they have a rubric and they're trying to identify in this assessment the instructional reading level and the independent reading level of each student. And what that does is it helps the teacher to identify with the instructional reading level their small groups that they're going to be working with and developing skills and strategies for reading. Their independent reading level kind of tells them what can they handle on their own. And so when kids are doing independent reading, what kinds of books should they have available in those book bags so that they can read on their own. So what you'll notice in the data set here is our end of year data from last year compared to our end of year data, uh, well, I'm gonna say spring of 2022 and spring of 2023, since we're already in the next school year, this school year. So what you'll notice in this data set is that in, um, in our kinder SEL, as well as in first grade, um, we maintained the percentage of students that were reading on or above grade level. And then we saw some gains in our pre-K circle, as well as in second grade BAS SEL. Just to clarify, the SEL assessment is the Spanish assessment given to our bilingual students, and the BAS is the English assessment. The one thing that I wanted to indicate here as well is even though in first grade and in kinder we maintained the same percentage of um, students who were on or above, we moved to the target because it was year two of implementation of this assessment. So for example, at the end of kindergarten in spring of 2022, the students had to be on a level C or higher in order to be considered at on or above. In the spring of 2023, we increased the target to a D. So even though the numbers represent the same percentage of students passing, we made the target more difficult for the BAS and SEL assessment. Now we did that because it was our second year of implementation. Year one, we wanted to make sure that we were calibrated and that we had um, everybody on the same page in that year one of implementation. And then um, this is our year two data. I'm going to continue on with our literacy data, um, Renaissance 360 EOY, focusing specifically on um, elementary. So when we look at this information, by the end of the year, last year, we were at 56% at or above benchmark overall as a district. And then in grades um, one through five, you'll notice that at the end of the year, we were um, well above the district average at um, our at or above percentages for our EOY REN360 data. Now REN360 is a nationally normed computer-based adaptive assessment. So that means as the student is taking the assessment, um, it thinks about how many questions it's getting right, how many questions they're getting wrong, and the time it's taking for the student to answer the questions, and then it automatically adjusts. And then it takes that assessment data and looks at national norming in order to determine the percentile. SGP, which is student growth percentile, that measures student growth. So what we're looking at is two data points for the same student over time to see if they're meeting our target of 35 points or higher, okay? And so that's the data that you're seeing on this screen. We also looked at um, comparison groups with our student, um, student groups, um, both uh, race and ethnicity, as well as some of our groups such as economically disadvantaged special education and our emergent bilingual. What you'll notice here on this um, page is that 
This year, or the spring of 2023, we were at 56% at or above. Last year, we were at 55 at this same time at spring 2022. Um, the other thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is in our SGP category. By the end of the year, spring 2023, we were at 59% of our students that had met the SGP indicators. Last at spring 2022, at this time we had 41%. So that was an increase of 18% between spring of 2022 and spring of 2023. So some of our areas that um, we've noticed in the data district wide, um, we we don't want our first graders to stay um, consistent. We want to see increases, right? We want to see more kids reading on or above level. Um, in first grade, the Renaissance 360 SGP data was showing less students meeting growth indicator than the district average. Okay, so we want to make sure that that, that SGP stays above the district average in those lower grades. Um, and in looking at campus-based data, which you will receive um, through your DIP summative, the data chart that has all of the campuses with this data, um, we did notice that most of our Title I campuses were below the district average in Renaissance 360 at or above benchmark. Some of our areas of strength, even though we're not... Um, where we want to be with second grade, we did see percentage increases in second grade, BASS and SEL. We did also see a trend in Renaissance 360 at or above benchmark since BOY increasing. So over the course of the year, we had more students that were at or above benchmark each time we tested. Um, and then in our analysis of our subpopulation um, data, we did see that our African American and our EB student population was above our district average, and that was something that we, um, we thought was beneficial to share. So what are our next steps? What are we doing because of the data? Well, um, we are implementing leveled literacy intervention for our tier three supports for students at all of our campuses. Our campuses that have a higher need, we have placed um, itinerant literacy interventionist teachers there. And many of our Title I campuses also have more than one literacy intervention teacher um, on the campus. Our bilingual Campuses have both a monolingual literacy intervention teacher and a bilingual literacy intervention teacher. We are also revamping some of our literacy resources for parent support. So we are in the process right now of kind of redesigning our, our website for parents that provides information on what literacy instruction looks like in Fort Bend ISD. We're in the process of adding videos to that so that parents can see what literacy instruction should look like inside of our district. We're also going to be launching some other parent supports um, related to that so that they have an idea of how, how we can support literacy at home. In terms of teacher supports, we have designed a brand new um, phonics curriculum, which I think we've talked about a little bit here in the boardroom. Um, but it is explicit phonics instruction with scripted um, daily lessons. It aligns with the science of teaching reading, which is the requirement from the state of Texas. And we have started doing some walkthroughs on campuses in order to monitor some of that and give feedback. We have developed a targeted professional learning plan where we have prioritized that enrollment to those courses to our Title I campuses. And we are working very uh, diligently with our principals and our teachers to get um, attendance to those. We've also prioritized certain campuses that are receiving PLC support. And what that means is we have um, members from teaching and learning and organizational development that are going to campuses and working with teachers on content knowledge development and also planning um, instruction using the curriculum, but also looking at data related to the data metrics we just took, uh, we just talked about. 
We're also working with campus leaders to develop their knowledge on what literacy instruction should look like and look for us in the classroom. Um, I believe it's next week. We have our first session with all APs in, um, in our district, and we're working with them on um, their knowledge of instruction in math and in literacy. And then we, as I said before, we are doing instructional walkthroughs. So we're going to transition to math. So um, what you're seeing here is the assessments that we give three times a year to our pre-K and kindergarten kiddos. Um, Circle and Text Kia, these are also individually administered, but they are on the computer. So the kids sit with their teacher and the test is on the computer, but the teacher's walking them through the test and listening to them talk and answer, and then they're inputting their, the data into the system. What you'll notice here with our data is that we did see an increase in text Kia from end of year 2022 to end of year 2023 by two percentage points. And then our pre-K, it dropped to one percentage, but we're still in the 90, 90 percentile. Okay. Our Renaissance 360 data for math. This includes, um, same as before, our elementary um, students with the overall district average. So our overall district average um, for at or above was 72% at the end of the year. And you'll notice that all of our elementary grade levels um, surpassed that district average. Second grade was the closest at only two points above that district average. We also can see here that we have um, an EOY SGP of 64% of our students who met the SGP indicator at the end of the year in the spring of 2023. Last year, same time, same data set was 36%. So we are seeing gains in the percentage of kids who are growing and when I say growing, I'm, we're targeting a, at least a year's worth of growth, right? You want a kid to grow at least a year. If they're already behind, we want them to grow more than that, right? They got to catch up. Um, but that's n nice gains in the math area um, with SGP. And then again, um, our subpopulation student groups related to that district average of 72%. So the things that I wanted you to know related to kind of areas of concerns or things that we're watching is that our EOY um, math data was 72% in spring of 2022 and spring of 2023. So the percent at or above has maintained within the last two years, and we want to see that increase. Our intervention system for math in our elementary is called Number Worlds, okay? It is a program that we've been using, but we're just now in year two of, con of everybody implementing the system. And so we're still working on consistency in that implementation. Um, and then the other thing that we noticed here is over the course of this school year, we had this basically the same number of students at or above benchmark between MOY and EOY. So we didn't see a lot of growth between those two. Um, and we're working on some in information related to the amount of time between those tests that might give us a little bit more accurate information. Um, in terms of areas of strength, I just mentioned this. This year, our SGP, or spring of 2023, 64% um, compared to spring of 22, which was 36%. Um, we did see an increase in REN 360 at or above benchmarks since the BOI in every elementary grade, some more than others, but um, we did see an increase. And then our Hispanic and EB REN 360 at or above benchmark um, was equal to or above the district average. So those two, and if you noticed, we had... Um, that indicator for the district average in with our EB population in both reading and in math. So, so what are we doing in math? What are our next steps? Some of the strategies are similar, but it's math instead of reading. 
Um, we have the Number Worlds Tier 3 Intervention System. We have math interventionists on um, each of our Title I campuses and math specialists at our non-Title campuses. We have deployed itinerant staff already to our campuses who maybe needed some additional support based on their numbers. Um, math resources, some at-home supports. Um, so we have created this year um, a consumable kind of a supplemental, um, I don't want to call it a packet, but it's, a, it's a, for every unit of instruction in elementary, we have taken each concept um, in the unit of instruction. We have pulled some Eureka math resources, which include the how to teach, right? So if I don't know how to teach the concept, details that, as well as some practice problems, and then some at-home learning connections, games that can be played at home to reinforce the math. We've provided those. Um, they can be printed out, and we've provided those to teachers um, so that they can be put in Schoology, but also provided them in PDF format so that campuses can print them um, as a supplemental resource. Um, we are also implementing Dreambox, um, which is an adaptive, um, personalized um, math software. Last year, we had it at our Title I campuses for three through eight, and we've been able to extend that to all of our elementary campuses this year. Um, we've launched that with principals this week, and we already have students in there working, and um, we will be looking at growth reports from that because it progress monitors. Teacher supports, again, we have professional learning plan that's designated for math content development and PLC supports um, by identified campuses. And then we're working with campus leaders in terms of um, how do you monitor instruction in a math classroom in elementary and give feedback to teachers. So we're working through that and also conducting some instructional walkthroughs. So that's the big district point of view um, in our end of year data. But I wanted you to be able to hear um, how our campus principals actually are utilized that data to help them launch the school year. So I've asked Ms. April Marsters, she is the principal of Drabeck Elementary, and Dr. Marta Rivas, she is the principal at Ridgegate Elementary to come and kind of just talk to y'all a little bit about how they use the data, their end of year data. Um, and then Mr. Lewis has also joined us from Ridgegate. I don't think he's speaking, but I did want to acknowledge that he's here to support his campus. So um, Ms. Marsters, do you want to come on up? And Dr. Rivas, and kind of share share with our um, board how y'all have used your data. Hi, good evening. I'm shorter. I don't have to start over, do y'all? <laughs> okay. In order to make some decisions um, about summer planning for students, about summer planning for teachers in order to prepare for the following year, um, and then also to bring our community and our teachers into the discussion about where we started, where we ended by the end of the year, and then um, to have some discussions about what are our plans with our CIP the following year. And so we bring all of those people into the discussion, looking at the data points and um, in order to promote student growth. Greetings, Board of Trustees and the rest of the people in the room. So at Ridgegate Elementary, um, we say every morning that we expect success and nothing less. And we do that through um, two essential elements. One is um, quality data instruction, quality, da quality instruction, and the other one is accurate use of the data. In order for us to use the data in an accurate way, we want to make sure that we are tri triangulating the data. So we're using multiple points of data to inform our decisions. We use that balance um, assessment framework that Melissa was talking about to triangulate these, those, those decisions. 
We do this in two different ways. At the end of the year, when we collect the data, we use whole group data to inform our decisions about trends, about needs for professional development of the teachers, and to inform our practices. How are we doing? What are our instructional strengths and weaknesses as a campus? And then we use individual student data to be surgically precise when we provide tier two and tier three instruction. So whole group data for tier one, trends, how we design instruction, and individual scores to design tier two and tier three interventions. We want to make sure that when we're creating those SMART goals for the students, they're really accurate and they're really precise and tailored to the specific needs of every student. So we use that data in that regard. The individual scores, they allow us to pinpoint the specific needs of individual students. Thank you, ladies. And so um, if y'all have any questions, we'd be happy to take those at this point. Thank you, Ms. Hubbard. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Masters and Dr. Revis for being here tonight and share your experience. And now, Dr. Gilliam. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the presentation. I have a few questions. Thank you, Ms. Masters and Dr. Revis for coming up that you answered many of my questions. So I, I guess where I am, um, as going through it, and I know it's an, it's an overview, and uh, we just started in the year, so I'm going to go on the other side of it after uh, Dr. Rivas and what you just shared, because I was taking notes. I'm hearing the story being told, so you're telling the story. I'm hearing something intentional. I heard summer planning, and I would like for us, to, who is the historian? Who is going to be the person that is going to find it, to really dig deep into where we are? So I was waiting for this is what we're going to do. And and I, I know that it's tough right now. It's tough and we're it seems like we're trying to find what we're going to do. We're... Um, you know, when we're talking about what are the, I, I believe we were back at student data literacy, areas of concern, areas of strength. Um, we, we don't see increase. We saw some increase. It's above benchmark. It's below. But there's not any way to measure that if we're not there looking at the data. So what I'm, but of course, again, at the end, I'm hearing that we are looking at the data. So I think um, just being more intentional to see where we are, if we're at 30 and we're at 40 and we're at 31 year or the first assessment and then we go to 40, well, how did we do that? And it's really digging deep and finding out what what is our successes. So in looking at literacy next steps, I'll just go there and then I'm, I'm going to hand it over. Where we have student supports, level literacy intervention, letter, I don't really know exactly how that looks. And I think that it would help to find out, well, how does that look and how does it help and what percentage, again, will, when we look at level literacy intervention, what does that really mean? How much time are we spending on that? And really digging deep into what is the process. Teacher supports, new phonics curriculum, scripted daily lessons. Okay, so the lessons are script. I know that helps teachers, but then how do we know that the lessons are being productive? Then going to targeted professional learning plan. Okay, we have that. We have PLC supports. Okay, I've sat in a lot of PLCs in my lifetime, and not necessarily each PLC you leave with something. So how are we making those to be specific for our students and, when, and for our teachers? So when a teacher leaves a PLC, he or she knows exactly what's going to go on or what is expected of them. Leader supports, pro professional learning for campus leaders. What type, of profession, what type of learning do our campus leaders need? And do we know that? Have we asked them? Have we asked them what they would like to, to know? And they, this is all just kind of those questions and that I'm wondering, you know, are we being intentional rather, you know, we, I, I see a lot. It's like there's, you know, this canvas and there's just a lot of on the canvas rather 
than being real specific. And maybe we are. And, and forgive me if, if I just didn't get that. Uh, the PLC supports. And then, you know, instructional walkthroughs, which are very, very good. But what, you know, what are we going to do with those professional walkthroughs or those, those instructional walkthroughs? Um, and I hear we started walkthroughs on campus. I would like to hear we started walkthroughs on campus on this date. We were able to do how many walkthroughs in this particular school. And that wouldn't be at this level. That would be working with our instructional specialist. So then I see instructional specialists. How are we using our instructional specialists? How are we using our teacher leaders? We have math specialists. How do we measure who is our best? So there's a lot of things here, but I, there's, I know this is just an overview, and I don't want to uh, sound, I'm glad that we have it, but I would like for the next time that we're just really intentional and we really understand what it is that we're doing. So again, I'm going to go back to uh, Dr. Rivas and Ms. Masters. Thank you for coming up. It gives me more information. You know, because then I heard, you know, Dr. Reva say the quality instruction, home group data, where are the instructional needs? I hear tier one, tier two, and tier three, which I did over uh, on the other side also. But I also heard SMART goals. So what are our specific needs? And if we can hone in on that with our principals and our principals hone in and, and totally take the data and own the data... And then from there, actually sharing that this is what this campus needs. Because I, what I am used to seeing is that we have some campus that, campuses that do this, and then the other campuses do this, and then there are some that just kind of stay under radar. So I'm going to hand it over. But thank you again, because it does give us some type of plan I would just like a more in, to see something a little bit more, well, a lot more intentional and how we know, how are we going to measure it? So before we, uh, Dr. Gilliam, I know you had a, it's some different points there. I'm not going to address all of them, but I do want to let you know that there is some, there is specificity to each of those components that I can follow up with um, and include in, in our next student achievement data presentation. Um, but I, I didn't want to move on without acknowledging that um, we do have very specific information related to what's on those next steps. Ms. Hubbard, can I also add, yeah. um, we did ask our leaders what they needed um, last year, and that was used to redesign the leader learning, and that is, you'll see that throughout this year in our focus on learning with our leaders. So we, have, we did ask them, and, and we've been very intentional and specific about the sessions and the learning throughout the year and our focus on learning sessions. And thank you. That's huge. That's huge. Thank you, Dr. Gilliam. Ms. Jones. Thank you, Madam President. And thank you, Dr. Gilliam, for that, That because I have questions. I have lots of questions. And... It always, we have this EOI data, but the first thing comes to mind is, okay, so how are, we, how are we going to attack this, okay? And so it starts with <clears throat> how are the PLC meetings utilized to support student learning? That is my biggest concern here. Because the reason why I'm saying this is because we have, especially the literacy data, and I guess I'm looking at it, how we're going to, how is this data used, utilized at the campus level to support student learning, okay? And I know we talk about walkthroughs and observations, but what is the evidence of learning that you're looking for? You know, what, what, what are you requiring? Are you requiring exit tickets? Are you requiring, what are you requiring of the teachers? And I think it needs to be universal. And I think we need to start, I guess, professional development where 
our schools that are succeeding can also help the teachers in areas that, are, that need some help or that are being challenged. So I think those are, uh, those are my questions. I see there's one thing that wasn't mentioned, and I want to talk about instructional coaching, okay? That's very important. And so I'm looking at it from a point of view. What are principals doing? How are teachers being coached? Because when they come into that PLC meeting, I, I know from experience, there's an expectation that you have a data presentation of your students' data and a plan of action for the next, what you're going to, how are you going to attack, uh, how are you going to get kids from meets, how are you going to get uh, kids from approaches, how are you going to get kids to masters. And I think that information is critical for PLC meetings, for teachers to take some type of responsibility and ownership of their data and have a plan of action in their classroom. So with that said, um, I think I, I love the math data, and the math data is great. However, I just feel that in some areas, and I'm just going to be blatant and just say we need to step it up. And so we, we really need to step it up. Um, I had one question about one of the programs. Um, lit oh, yeah. Uh, like Dr. Gilliam said, that level literacy intervention. What does that look like? Um, can somebody help me here? <laughs> what does it look like? I mean, I can answer it or yeah, yeah, go <laughs> ahead. the go principals ahead. can. <laughs> Yeah. You. Um, so level liter literacy intervention is a, um, an accelerated literacy program where you pull small groups, uh, no more than four kiddos okay. um, with a trained, certified literacy teacher. Okay. Um, we don't pull them from tier one instruction, so they still get the almost two hours that's built into the day of ELA instruction. Okay. We they get pulled during intervention time. So there's an intervention block built into the school day um, for each grade level. And that literacy intervention teacher works with those small group of kids on very specific reading strategies okay. um, and behaviors to try to accelerate them to get them to read faster, right? More than a year's worth of growth. Um, and so they are increasing the books that they're, that they're using, the levels that they're using based on how the students are growing. Um, they do something called a reading record where they're yes, running records. Yeah. Yeah. Where they are tracking the kids and then they have to report that to speak to Dr. Gilliam's like, what are you, what are you collecting? What are you gathering? So they submit those progress measures. Um, every two weeks, they're required to do that, and they are supposed to see the kids every day. Okay. They see the kids ev every day, um, and then they report their progress every two weeks, and then we're trying to make sure that those kids are accelerating their growth. Now, they report that in a district tool that we monitor. We look at it, and you had said, like, what coaching is happening, right? So we look at the data and we make a determination on whether or not um, the kids are growing at the rate that they need to be at, at the campuses. If we see data, it's either not turned in because the, they're not keeping up with it or um, maybe they just hadn't gotten it into the system yet or we see that they're, we're not seeing the growth that should be then we, we consult with them. We will, um, I have folks in teaching and learning, we jump on a, we either jump on a Teams call with them, we'll go over their data with them, we will observe them um, doing an LLI group and give them feedback on that. Um, and it, when we do have concerns that maybe they, they are not meeting those marks, we will consult with the principals and we'll say, hey, what's going on? Um, but, you, I mean, you saw the data at some campuses, um, they have more kids that need the tier three intervention than people, right? So if you have two um, 
We call them LITs. You know, everything's an acronym in education. But if you have two LITs on a campus and they're seeing four kids for each grade level, but you have 40% of first grade who's not reading on level, that LIT isn't going to be able to do tier three LLI with all of those kids. So then we have to think about, as Ms. Rivas was talking, Dr. Rivas was talking about, what are the tier two supports? Then we have to look at tier one instruction and say, how often are you pulling small groups? Um, and then we have to think about the kids who are in that 45 minutes of intervention with their teacher because they can't be pulled for LLI, there's not room for them. And so we have to prioritize which kiddos get into that LLI system. And if they make the progress that they need to, they can exit out of that and we can pull more kids in. Okay. And so um, how are the reading interventionists, how are they being used? Uh, for those students who are, um, for our struggling, uh, because if we have teacher pooling small group, are we having also using our reading interventionists to do some pullouts as well with those kids who are also struggling? Yes. So our 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 literacy intervention teachers, um, they are pulling small groups of students all day long. Okay. In every grade level. Um, so if you look at a master schedule, kindergarten. Um, they might have their intervention time first thing in the morning. And so that's when um, they're, they're getting pulled for either math intervention okay. or literacy intervention. We also use that time to provide dyslexia supports and things of that nature. So um, they are pulling kids all day. They get one planning period like a teacher would. They're on a teacher pay scale okay. um, so that they can look at their data and analyze their students. Um, and then if time allows in their master schedules, some of their literacy intervention teachers have the ability to sit in in a PLC. Um, some campuses have instructional coaches, so their model looks a little bit different. But um, if they have the ability to push into a PLC, then they're helping build the content knowledge and capacity of, of the teams. Okay. And just one quick question. Are the PLCs uh, happening every week or are they happening every other week? So campuses design their PLC schedules. Okay. Um, but there are several actions that should be happening in a PLC, right? Right. There's building clarity of my content. What TEKS am I supposed to teach? What is the rigor level? What assessment am I going to be giving so I can mm -hmm. align my instruction to that um, that assessment? And then that data analysis piece. And that could be analyzing student work like you had mentioned. We've all agreed on a common formative assessment we're going to give, and now we're going to look at that data. Um, all of those things should be happening in their PLCs, and those are those expectations that we have defined. Um, and then the campus leaders define that PLC schedule based on what works best for their master schedules. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Before we continue more questions, I just want to remind everyone we do have a DIP, CIP workshop coming up. And I will appreciate it if you can keep some of the questions offline or send in the questions and then so they can prepare and answer that during the workshop. I also wanted to acknowledge the, the board trustees serving on the student achievement committee. I see Ms. Hannah is taking notes and Ms. Malone and Ms. Jones because that's how we make it effective. So they can have small, small group meetings and trying to get information to present to the board. So, um, so I'm going to ask the board if you do have some information or question you wanted to ans get answered today, please go ahead and ask. Otherwise, I encourage everyone to, to send you in, in the questions for, um, for the workshop. So that being said, Ms. Malone. Yes, thank you, President Day. First of all, Mrs. Martinez and Dr. Lawson, thank you for meeting with our committee. Um, I want to tell you that I love the bar graph on here because I think it really does show and tell the story. In addition to that, um, same thing with the columns. And 
I know Rome wasn't built in a day. And so this is, I guess, what I'm trying to convey to everyone um, in my point of view. I want to focus on the SGP data and what you said, both in math and in literacy, and that there were gains from 18% in literacy to 28% in math. And so for that, for anyone who's working in the district and with our kids, I want you to know that I greatly appreciate your hard work and that Rome wasn't built in a day and we are recovering from COVID still and you guys are working your tails off to make things happen and I appreciate it. To Mrs. Marsters and Dr. Rivas, thank you so much for your time and being here and conveying how you guys utilize this data in order to make decisions on your campuses and that they're, it's clearly effective in making some progress and headway where we are. Are we where we want to be? No. But are we going in the right direction? It, it looks like so. And for that, I appreciate it. I appreciate the transparency and accountability here. And I look forward to forward progress. I do have one question for you ladies and whoever wants to take it. And that question would be, as a mama who has um, an elementary age kid and tons of friends in the district with elementary age kids, you know, one thing we struggle with as, as parents is honestly uh, – working in this digital age technology and knowing where in the world we're doing what. We're at a new campus this year and they do it completely different than where we were at before. Now, with that said, my question to you, um, you mentioned the consumables, and I, I wasn't aware of this, but the Eureka Consumables Math and At-Home Learning, how can parents access these consumables district-wide is number one. The second question I have, and because we're we're trying to move things along. I'm going to ask both. The second question I have, and this is for you two ladies, is what do you wish parents would know? And what would you like for parents? What do you wish they, how could they support you and your school and your efforts of, of the teachers in order to work collectively together? We know, and as Ms. Hannon mentioned earlier, that it's not just district administration. It's not board of trustees. It's not the principals. It's not the teachers. It's everyone working together. So what do you wish the parents knew and how could they support this collective effort? And then I'm done. I'll let them answer your question first um, and then I'll answer the Eureka. So as far as technology is concerned, your student has access to Clever through one link. Everything that you need is gonna be in there. So if you click on one link, go to their Clever app, all of their apps for any type of um, remediation support. They have books. They can access online books through the library at home. They can access the consumables through that resource. The dream box that she talks about, they can have the extra practice at home. Everything that they need is a one-stop shop. The district did a really good job of making it easily accessible. The kids access Clever through one link every single day at school. They know how to log in. They know how to click on the buttons and what they want to do, or if there's an assignment, they know how to access those because the teachers do a good job of modeling that for them in their day-to-day, -day. okay? As far as um, the, the kind of the collaboration piece with our families, um, I think it's communication. That's going to be the key here, talking to your teachers, having those parent conferences, coming to the parent informational nights, coming to the schools and being a part of the school system and being part of the focus groups that we hold. Help us make the decisions that you want to um, see impact your students and their growth. Give us feedback of what your needs are. We're here to listen. We have those opportunities. So we'd really like to see more of our families on campus talking to us about their student needs and giving us feedback and being part of the and being a participant in those plans. Yes. So at Bridgegate, um, as April was saying, um, if you go second grade and above, you're going to see the kids working on Clever, working on One Links. They're perfectly able to access it by themselves so they can go home and do the same and kind of show to their parents. For grades, kinder and first, our parent educator with a Title I school with an echo this of, uh, of a rate of 98%. So our parent educator is essential in our campus to help the parents accessing those things. She helps, uh, she holds um, workshops. She has classes for the parents in order to teach them how to utilize those, those district tools. We offer computer classes, basic computer classes, um, parenting classes that, to support 
learning also ESL classes for our parents as well. So we articulate it in a way in which any parent can learn how to access, at least in order to monitor. So depending on um, the needs of the family, we have the systems of support. And in terms of what I want my parents uh, or our parents to know, I want them to know that we are a team, that we are one, that we're on the same side, and that we're here for, for the students and for them to really have that trust. I think trust is the essential currency. That as, uh, I think that the leader is the, um, is the beholder of the trust uh, of the community. So I think that they need to learn that, they need to know that. And the way that we do that is one magic word that is transparency. When you're transparent, they, they trust you. So it's a two-way. Thank you, Ms. Malone. And thank you, uh, Ms. Masters and Dr. Rivas, for being here. And next, we, we have Ms. Hannan. Thank you, Ms. Day. Um, thank you, Mrs. Marsters and Dr. Rivas for being here. I know you've had a long day, and thank you, um, Ms. Hubbard. So I, I appreciate Ms. Malone's comment about, you know, we didn't build Rome in a day, and that, re that refers to our students, but it also refers to how this board is going to start looking at student outcomes and digesting that. And so I appreciate the work that Dr. Lawson and Ms. Martinez did with our group. And so what I, I'm going to ask, I, I have taken some notes listening to, to what Dr. Um, Gilliam is wanting and Ms. Jones, but if the rest of the board could, you know, rather succinctly, if you have some wishes in what you want to see in the data as it, it as it's presented, because what we have had the conversation is we want it to be digestible in a way where we're looking at district wide data. And then when we go to look at our our Friday updates and there's campus level data in there that it's going to help. There, there's going to be that connection and, and you can better understand that. So our goal wasn't to be looking at campus level data because we just don't with. 80,000 students, we don't have that bandwidth to do that during meetings. Um, the other thing I would, would really want us to do is, because we don't want to make the board meetings longer, we know we're a giant district, so we've got lots of contracts, we've got lots of other things that, that smaller districts don't just, they just don't have. So, you know, just asking, you know, come prepared, think about your questions, move through our, our student outcomes questions, in, in a way that, that we move forward. But I do, I do want to, um, I want to thank Ms. Day for talking, you know, reminding everybody this, the uh, campus improvement planning and the district improvement planning is coming. So I actually have two questions um, about the data. And, you know, sometimes I'm embarrassed to ask my questions, but I, you know, I model, you know, no, no questions, a dumb question, although sometimes mine are. Um, so on the, the, Literacy and the math data, where you have the, in the green, the, the at above benchmark, mm -hmm. and the overall is a 56 for literacy, and it's um, 72. a 72, and, and I'm just kind of doing some simple ma math in my head, and I'm not, is that including secondary? What, why is that number not working for me in That my is head? an district overall. Yes, district so including all of the students who took this assessment, including six through twelve. Okay, mm -hmm. so in in my mind, that's a little bit of a that that confuses my brain because this this data, if we're if we're kind of trying to chunk and chew to make it more digestible, I want the average of the group I'm looking at. Does that make sense? And maybe it doesn't yeah. matter to the rest of the board, but to me, that just that's. That, that, that is doable. That, we, that makes yep. me understand better when you use the line of, of here's the, the district benchmark, but you're only looking at a certain grade, grade set. Okay. So thank you for clarifying that. Also, thank you for clarifying that you raised the bar on the BAS and the SEL because that helped, you know, I know it's written there with an asterisk, but I didn't understand it. Um, so thank you. Thank we are not that. adjusting that for this year, just so everybody okay. knows. We wanted to get to the publisher's recommendation, 
Um, and that's why we moved it. For and that's this where year. we are now. And that's we where are we are at, now. So, the, okay. Yes. The, then the final, um, the final question is because, um, along the lines of Ms. Malone, I actually want to ask, because if, if teachers have the capability to print the math practice sheets and, and it sounds like a packet, so you can call it a packet, um, do, do the campuses have funding and do their copy machines have the, the number, the, the so contract number in there, there to do something like that? That's great. It lets me go back to Ms. Valone's question. So they have, um, all teachers have access to them in, in the curriculum in Schoology. And they can, all they have to do is click on, you know, say, the little cog wheel that they have. And they can move it into their course so that the students can access it. Okay. They also have the ability to print them if they wanted to print them for all kids or a select group of kids. We also provided these um, packets to the print shop. Um, and so we were working uh, with that group so that instead of a copy machine at a campus having to print them, they could submit the, their order to the print shop and print off ma uh, more quantities of them so that somebody at the campus wasn't doing that. So we've been working with that. We've also worked with business and finance so that we can track how much um, is being requested from the campuses on this um, to see how, how much is really being spent. But when we looked at this option, as opposed to purchasing an actual consumable, um, what we worked out with business and finance is that we would track to see how much money was being spent at the print shop with this new option and then make a determination on if we needed to allocate anything to the campuses. Okay, because I, I, I do think there is a place for packets or paper pencil. And you know what? It, it, as a parent, I have three printers in my house. I have computers in my house. But is it easier for me to say, honey, bring me that paper and let's sit down together to, to figure this out? It, it is. And so I just don't want that to be a barrier. I don't want finances to be a barrier for campuses who want to use that. And I'm glad to hear that that resource is, is available. And I'll stop because I ask everybody to be succinct and then I wasn't. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hannon. Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Mrs. Day. Mrs. Hubbard, thank you as always. Uh, so a few quick questions. So I thought Ms. Hannon was going to ask my question because she started with my numbers. So the 72% and the 56%. So correct me if I'm wrong, but going back 2019, those both would have been closer to each other. So that gap between math and reading oh, is... The I don't want to misquote any of the data, but um, yes, when we were closer to um, I think we were low COVID, 70s, probably. Yeah, th those numbers were cl closer together. Right. right. So but any, I would want to look to make sure I have the yeah, yeah, yeah. accurate data. Yeah, I believe that's the case. So, I, so just typically, that's not, there's not a gap between overall reading outcomes and overall math outcomes. Usually the gaps are the students who struggle in one struggle in both and the students who, for the most part, uh, there are obviously exceptions, but, um, so any explanation on, on uh, it? So just, it appears that our, uh, our outcomes have recovered to around the pre COVID levels in math, but not reading. So. Well, we, we also didn't look at star data. I remember we started the conversation really processing through not one data one data point doesn't tell the whole story. So when we do our, our workshop with DIP and when we get into our star data, I'd like for us to more look at that holistically because when you start to analyze those data points, there isn't a great uh, discrepancy. So, um, okay. but I want to also go back and look at that historical data that you were talking about before I make an assumption. Gotcha. Cool. And Thank you. We can um, add that, next Mr. Hamilton. Next question, just uh, so it says that leveled literacy intervention is one of the student supports. Um, how are we evaluating the intervention? Would that be the intervention curriculum? It is. It is a program. Um, it's very. Um, 
script it's very scripted in the sense of you do this with this group and then it tells you tells you what to do um, we are looking at a few different indicators so with any kind of intervention system, consistency is key, right? Especially for kids who are that far below reading. They need to be reading all the time, right? Every day they need to have access. So we are looking at attendance. Are the kiddos showing up every day? Because if they're not, it you know, you, you make a little bit of progress and then they're not there and then you might slide back a little bit. So we do look at attendance. We are monitoring the size of their groups, right? So are they pulling the required? Um, and then we're looking at the progress measure. So we have some milestones related to after you've been in intervention for, let's say, six weeks, how far should we have progressed? And so the um, LITS, we met with them and um, explained the expectation of the, this tracker that they are filling out. And so they t they are going to do their um, reading records according to what's in the, um, the LLI kit. Then they put the data inside of, of their tracker. And that's what we're looking at to see if they're making the progress that they should. So there's three different data points we're looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Ms. Jones. Okay. So I actually had the had Eureka Math training this summer. And so um, I'm kind of confused. You said you didn't purchase the consumables? So we are using what TA has recommended as the free, right? The okay. free version. The free access. Okay. Because it's uh, one of the recommended resources from TEA. Okay. And then um, we did not, so there's different types of consumables that you can purchase from Eureka, right? Right. Um, what we've done is taken the resources that we have access to from, re, from Eureka and we created kind of a um, customized um, packet for the unit of instruction. So we looked at our curriculum. Mm-hmm. And the concepts or the modules inside of Eureka. Right. And we pulled out the, the resources that were relevant to that unit of instruction. Instead of purchasing the whole consumable book, um, because um, in the past we have not had, cons uh, we have had a lot of waste when we've purchased consumables. Okay. With them not being utilized um, completely. So is there like a limit? Because I'm, I'm, is Eureka optional rather than required to be utilized for math? In our district or in the state? In our district. In our district, Eureka Math is a, considered our supplemental resource. So our curriculum is our primary resource. And then what we've done in the curriculum, because... Our, mod, our curriculum scope and sequence might not follow the modules that are in Eureka. So what we've done is we've said, okay, in Eureka for this unit of instruction, these are the components of Eureka that align. And we've given that reference in the curriculum for the teachers to use. Or we've linked to some of the resources that are in Eureka if it pertains to that unit of instruction. Okay. But but Eureka Math is not our curriculum. It is our supplemental resource. The reason why I'm saying that is because I'm just having experience with those consumables. It's like you're kind of missing out on the sequence of instruction. And that's what I'm concerned about because in the beginning, there's like fluency practice for kids. And then there's also where the teaching actually occurs with the concept development and then the kids actually work and apply, do an application problem. And then even in the Eureka Math comes its own exit ticket. And so even with that, you can really get some data from that rather than just kind of picking and choosing because it's kind of like the learning is sequential. You know, it's from beginning to end in a way that it introduces the concept, but it also assesses the mastery of their concept. 
as well. So our teachers have access to the to the materials for Eureka Math. Okay. Uh, everything you described, our teachers have access to that in the online environment. But then also in that consumable packet, outside of that, part of that is something that some of the kids take home, which is that like a workbook or homework. It's very thin, but it also re uh, it gives it helps the teacher out when it comes to giving homework. Right, so and that's what we that's here. what we embedded inside of these um, the at home learning cons that we had created. Okay. So we pulled some of those practice problems that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. We also pulled there's like a little page that sh it's like an at home teach, right? It it does a what we call a worked example, right? Right, right. It has the worked example. It has the practice problems. Right. And then there's also a component of it that says what you can do at home. And then it has like suggestions. And some of them are as easy as get out a deck of cards. And it's a really quick strategy that a parent can do just to reinforce um, number sense at home. Those kinds of things are what we included in that. Um, instead of purchasing a bunch of consumables that we ended up recycling at the end of the year because they weren't used. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Ms. Malone, we're going to move on. Is that okay? And Judy, on that consumable packet, because we talked about this previously. And Ms. Hubbard, I thought we were going to make a link available for parents who did want to purchase it. And did that happen? We didn't make these public because we, we needed to keep them in our Schoology because that's a login, right? So for copyright reasons, we have not put these um, at-home resources on our website. But I think you're referring to specific parents purchasing. Well, we talked about Eureka last time. Not last time, like, a, yeah. I don't know what exact date. I'd have to go look in the board book. But we spoke about this specifically before because we talked about limitations with copy paper, et cetera, um, and whether folks wanted or did not want uh, supplements for at home and some parents do and there have been folks who had communicated to us all last year with frustrations of not having access to materials and we previously mentioned there would be a way where parents could purchase it and we talked about possibly a bulk purchase with parents who wanted to via the district or however so I'm just asking where we left off with that because it sounds like that's not an it, nothing came to fruition for that. And now, if I'm understanding correctly, it's the, the teachers then need to, each at their own discretion, communicate to the parents whatever modules they pull for them to access. Or then I heard, you know, Clever, they can go into Clever. Do they have access to all of the resources in Clever? So we did research on the amount of money that it would take in order, if we did purchase from the district level, um, these con the consumables that we were just talking about. Um, well, the consumables from Eureka. Um, based on our past experiences with the use of the consumables, that purchase was going to be a lot, a lot of district funds if we did it holistically. Um, if we made it available just to certain parents, parents do have the ability to purchase these workbooks, but we didn't want that to be our district-wide solution because then we would have a subset of families that Equity. wouldn't be able to access them. So we came up with an alternative solution that both gave the tangible components of the workbook that are meaningful for teachers and families um, with a um, more financially friendly option for us to be able to print them here in 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 house instead of um, purchasing them through. Um, okay. Through so one last comment on it. So when I look at that bar graph, the only thing I'm going to mention with this paper and in this graph is SPED and ECODIS. Those are the two most concerning groups. And specifically, you know, we're talking about essentially equity with that. With economically disadvantaged kids, I hope to God we are providing those teachers enough resources for paper. And I'm just going to 
say this. Um, I'm hearing from teachers that that may not be the case in some campuses. And so it, there may be differences between campus to campus based on principles, on allocation of resources, where some campuses teachers are only getting two packets of paper a month right now. And I just, y'all can go figure that out with, with teachers and your principals and address the situation. But I just want to make sure our children, particularly in that economically disadvantaged group, have access to the materials. I think what, what I'm hearing really from you is we, um, we can certainly, we will certainly go back and talk with our principals about and reinforce this as an option. Um, I'll collaborate with, with Dina and in our special education department to see if that's an option um, for certain groups of students that might need, you know, that is an option. Um, but it is a message we can reinforce with our building principals and, um, and the option to use the print shop. And then that way, you know, the teachers aren't having to go to the copy machine and use their own paper or their own, we call them clicks, right? Your own clicks at the copy machine. Um, because that is an option, and we can be more proactive about communicating that. Thank you, Ms. Malone. And thank you, Ms. Jones and Ms. Malone, for those questions. But uh, we, we are going to move, move on to the next agenda item. And thank you, Ms. Hubbard, for your presentation. And so next, we have consent agenda. Do we have discussion? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and if you, I'm, I'm asking if anyone needs to pull any item. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Ms. Jones. I would like to pull only one, and that would be consent agenda item E. E, certified teacher waiver? Yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Gilliam, are you making notes? Okay. Is there any other items? Yes, Ms. Day. I would like to pull consent agenda item 12G, the House, House Bill, Bill 3, 3 resolution. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other items? I'm going to pull the consent agenda 12M10. Long range boundary planning. M10. Can we have a motion for the rest of the agenda, consent agenda item? I move the board to approve consent agenda item with the exception of 12E, 12G, 12M10, all others as presented. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Gilliam, second by Ms. Hannon. Do we have discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. Motion passes 7 0. Next, we have a consent agenda 12 E. Can I have a motion? Yes, Madam President, I move to approve consent agenda item 12 E as presented. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Malone, second by Ms. Hannon. Do we have a discussion? Ms. Jones. Yes, there's discussion. And um, I asked some questions um, that I want the public to know. And I just wanted to let the admin know that I'm voting for it. So don't worry about that part. But <laughs> So I I'm, I'm voting for it. But I want the public to know who's in their child's classrooms. Um, as far as who's teaching their child, who's in front of their, uh, who's, who's in, front of their child every day. And so we have an instructional apprentice program. I think, uh, Ms. Johnson, is it the first year? 
in its first year? Yes, this is the first year. Okay, so this is our first year. And so I'm going to go through some of the questions. I'm not going to go through all of the answers, but just kind of get the gist of where we are. And I have some recommendations. So moving forward, um, we can just kind of like tighten this up a little bit. Okay. Um, my question was, uh, what percentage of these instructional apprentice apprentices have not taken uh, their content exam? And what areas of content are they teaching without the required exams? And that was my question. The response was 100% of the instructional apprentices have not taken or passed certification assessments. One of our requirements was to be accepted in an alternative certification program. And once these instructional apprentices take and pass the assessment and meet other ACP requ requirements, such as the modules and the observations, they will receive their statement of eligibility and they will be able to teach under an intern certificate for one year. And so my next question was, um, does the district have a specific timeline for completion of these exams? And the response was, yes, the employment agreement states as soon as possible, but no later than March 18th, 2024, to pass assessments and receive statement of eligibility. It is important to know that instructional and apprentices can pass the exam and, re and receive their SOE at any time before March 18th. And to date, we only have, we already have nine instructional apprentices that have converted to Chapter 21 teacher contracts. And if we hire more instructional apprentices after October 15th, they will have until March 2025 to obtain statement of eligibility. My next question was, what pay scale are they currently working on? In other words, what is the salary for this position? And our pay and benefits agreement with the instructional apprentices is 263.16 daily rate, which equates to $50,000 a year if they work the entire 190-day agreement. There are medical benefits eligible, TRS contribution, local and personal days are given, and failure to obtain an SOE by established deadline date results in a resignation effective last teacher workday. Um, this was the next question is the cons one one of my um, wonderings, <laughs> and I just wanted to know. I don't see it here. Um, is testing history considered? Basically, um, is testing history considered in the requirements for securing an internship? And TEA has limit. TEA has a limit of five attempts per t content exam. Most school districts require two to three attempts per exam before, in, before becoming ineligible for an internship. What is Fort Bend ISD's testing requirement? And the response was, we disqualify candidates who failed a specific assessment more than three times. So that is our, that's our requirement. Please put that on the website. <laughs> if you don't do anything else, please put that on the website. Um, are there any fees paid by Fort Bend ISD alternative certification program that are associated with the hiring of instructional apprentices? There are 13 instructional apprentices who are part of the University of Houston ACP cohort, and we are paying $61,750 for candidates in this program. That is half the cost of the ACP, with the district paying the remaining half. And six of these employees have already received their statement of eligibility. The district does not pay any fees to any other ACP provider. Last question. I, have it. I had other questions, but this is another uh, important question, I thought. Um, is the district generating any revenue from all, certain, uh, all ACP programs for hiring instructional imp apprentices and interns or, pro or probationary certificates? No, the district is not generating any revenue. And so I went on to ask, and I didn't, uh, that's how I found out this was the first year. 
I request the star reading and math data for school year 21 to 22 and school year 22 to 23. But since this is our first, we don't have that data. But we need to keep a close watch on how effective our instructional apprentices are. So having said that, here are some of my recommendations. Um, one, include the test in history. Put it on the website. Also, include a GPA requirement because that's not on the website either. So we need to, uh, uh, candidates need to see that. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I would have a preference to have the candidates to pass the content exam before December because I'm thinking about not only EOI, I'm thinking about MOI data to see where those instructional apprentices are and whether or not do they need help in their instructional practice. And then just close monitoring of their data. And I don't know, maybe we'll have a discussion about this, but limiting the number of instructional apprentices that are in our Title I schools, that are schools that are struggling. We should have a limit on those uh, apprentices as well. We, we really need our best teachers in those schools as well. And with that said, I think moving forward at some point, Fort Bend ISD should keep the money in-house and have their own ACP program like some of the other school districts are also moving toward it as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for the questions and make it clear to the board. Yes. Thank you. And Ms. Hannon? Yes. Um, could, could staff tell me what, what is the difference between a Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 campus? I'm referring to, this might be um, HR. This is, I'm, I'm asking, it's in the staffing standards guideline. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Mason can provide that response. And Dr. Limley. Testing. Good evening. Um, we look at EcoDisc mostly, um, and we look at the needs of the campus based on other assessment data, um, demographics, things like that. But if I could say consistently, I would say if you lined up EcoDisc and went up, the tiers kind of go from the lowest EcoDisc tier three. Uh, tier two would be in the middle, and tier one would be um, the lowest e eco disc at the top. And so we're staffed based on that. So a tier so, three campus, the ratio. So Dr. Mason, are you saying that tier one have the most economically dis? No, the tier least. three. They have the least. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And so I asked that question because here is where I try very hard to accept the recommendations from the administration. But the kicker is this waiver requires, the state requires the board of trustees vote on it. So, so the legislature and the education code want us looking at this. And so when I hear Ms. Hubbard describe how we have um, insufficient numbers of interventionists to, to address the needs um, the ch of our, our kids that are having challenges in reading and math. And I hear her say, you know, we have to look at what we're doing in tier uh, one intervention in our class and that the teachers, uh, you know, are they doing um, reading groups? That, that's what I heard Miss Miss uh, Hubbard say. And so one only has to do the math uh, that, you know, maybe a second grader can do in knowing that the more kids you have, the harder it is to get all those reading groups in. And so the, I'm getting to my point here is I know that there weren't very many apprentices on the list of folks who were on this waiver list, but it would be my request for the district. I know this is our first year, but in the future, you know what? It's hard for a seasoned, certified teacher, even teachers with graduate degrees to get all of those reading groups in for our, our, our little ones. 
And I can't imagine how much harder that is for someone who is not only teaching, but they're working on their ACP, they're working on their alternative certification, and they're, they're, they're learning as they go. And so I would just really ask next year that we have zero apprentice teachers on the waiver list and that looking at the staff, the, the, the guidelines, because tier three campuses don't have much cushion. They only, the, to me, the tier three campuses are actually meeting the state ratio, required ratio of 22 to one. And then we have our own staffing that goes 23 to one from second through fourth. So anyway, that is my ask as a trustee who has to vote on this waiver report annually is that we look very carefully and and I would go so far to say even if we could consider having folks that have emergency permits not on there but more so apprentice folks that are still in their programs and they're I'm assuming they are going to those courses at night in the evenings that's a lot that's a lot on that staff member's plate. So that was really my only question was about, I didn't understand what the tier one, tier two, and th tier three campuses. So mostly Dr. Limley, Dr. Mason, it's just a, it was just a, it's more of an ask for, for us to consider that next year before this waiver comes to the board for a vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Day. Thank you, Ms. Hannon. Dr. Gilliam. And just very quickly, uh, thank you, Ms. Jones, for those questions and having those answers available uh, for this evening. Uh, but I'm going to go on the other side of this. Uh, can we hear uh, the teacher shortage is the reason why we're doing this. And seasoned certified teachers are far in between. So where the teacher apprentices come and, and all of these different, we're trying to get people in the classroom so we can at least keep that low number. So somebody needs to, to talk about it because we're saying what we don't want, but what we don't want, then we're gonna have an empty class or classes yeah. that are overcrowded. So can someone talk about sure, that? Sure, I can you. talk. I'll just give one basic statement that Amber can complete it, but you're correct. Two reasons for instructional apprentice this year is one for trying to be innovative with staffing, and the second one is for recruiting because there is a teacher shortage. And Amber has been working diligently with the team on this, and she can provide additional details. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilliam. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, our, our goal always would be to put a fully qualified, certified teacher in every single classroom. That's what everybody would want. Um, but the reality of the situation, as I said last year, is the state of last week in the meeting, the state of Texas lost 39,000 certified teachers last year. We, we lost 50,000 and only certified 19. So 31,000 teachers left the profession. Um, this is going to be an ongoing issue for the long term. Um, we are looking at things like, you know, how to grow our own, how to build our own uh, ACP programs as future alternatives. Um, but for now, this was the only way to ensure that you had somebody who was a degreed professional seeking to be an educator in the content area that, you know, they, they're trying to be certified for and committed to being in a classroom the entire year. The alternative to that would have been empty classrooms that we're trying to cover with substitute teachers who aren't degreed professionals in many cases, or having our already overworked existing staff covering classrooms during their planning periods, or having certified administrative staff, staff teaching kids remotely. There would have been inconsistency. There would have been um, classrooms that were not covered. There would have been kids, especially in the high needs areas at Title I campuses, at um, in those high needs areas for SPED and bilingual that didn't have a consistent, caring, educated, professional adult in their classroom all year long. And that was the reason why we went this direction. We did not start hiring instructional apprentices until late June, once the date had passed for people to, you know, teachers to opt out of their contracts. There was no longer an option to fill our, you know, our, our related vacancies with someone who was a degreed certified professional. So at that point, this was really our best option. 
uh, gave us the chance to promote and grow our own people. More than 50% of the people we have in our um, instructional apprentice program came from within Fort Bend ISD. They were substitutes. They were paraprofessionals. We're growing them into being teachers, and you know, hopefully that'll make them stay with Fort Bend ISD because we're growing them right here. So um, this was really an innovative uh, approach. It was something uh, that a lot of districts are doing, but Fort Bend, I believe, did it better than some of the other districts because of the approach we took. Our teachers, instructional apprentices, already had to have their degree. They already had to be in an ACP program. They had to have not exhausted too many of their test uh, testing um, options. And so we wanted to put the most qualified people in and give our existing staff the chance to grow by making them benefits eligible. Most paraprofessionals weren't going to take that opportunity if we if we took benefits away from them because they have those benefits as paraprofessionals. So um, it was really a way to fill those vacancies. And this is going to be a challenge for years to come because more people are leaving the profession of education than they are joining it. So we're going to have to be more creative and put more resources towards this uh, in the future. Thank you, Dr. Gilliam. That was a great question. Thank you for the answer and the clarification. I, I remember there's um, you, there's a statement in our packet saying you're trying, you know, we try to get a certified teacher first before we uh, come to this path. So I appreciate you clarify the, everything for the community and for the board. So Ms. Malone. Yes, and I appreciate that as well. I do have one question. So I was grateful to hear of some uh, a retired principal ran into just the other week who's actually helping with new younger principals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fantastic. And I'm I, awesome, right? So hats off HR and whoever is behind all of that. Thank you. Here's the question I have on that. To Ms. Hannon and Ms. Jones' point, I, I can understand where they're coming from and the concerns that they have. I think we all share the, the concerns as well. Mm -hmm. um, but are we engaging our retired teachers like who have we've, we've referred to how many have retired and I think we all know a few who've at least a couple handfuls that retired just just this past year but are we engaging them to maybe come back and mentor some of these younger teachers I know we have the the mentor program within the the school and the framework but I'm asking specifically are we doing anything to bring them back to where they can basically model what it does look like to do small group instruction and these more challenging tasks with differentiating education. We do bring retirees back on a consultant basis to support things, specifically for the instructional apprentice. I'm not aware that currently we have retired teachers, but I mean, certainly that's an option that exists if somebody wants to come back and do it. And we do bring retirees into consultant roles um, after they've retired, if they're willing to come back and do that. Obviously, you have some issues there with TRS and they're, they've become much more expensive resources uh, at the point where they're retired. Um, you know, and, and you bring them back into a, a TRS eligible type of role. But it's certainly something that's an option if, if they want to do it. Okay. I, I think whatever, whatever you guys are doing, and I don't need to know the answer right this moment, but to support these apprentices, mm -hmm. whether it's on site on campus via an AP or maybe an instruction leader, whatever it might be, if y'all could share that information with us on how those apprentices specifically are being supported in the classroom. Yes, absolutely. So they are being supported at the campus level and then district wide every Thursday, there are representatives from the organizational development and HR teams that are going and doing campus visits. They're doing observations um, on site with their TAP mentors uh, that are on the campus um, to evaluate how they're doing. Um, and put all of the instructional apprentices and the zero-year teachers, those who have the least experience, onto a heat map to make sure that those that are really needing extra support are getting support above and beyond what they're going to get from the campus level or just from having a TAP mentor. Um, so that's that's something that is going, that assessment's going on, the school year just started. So weekly, they're doing those campus visits and looking at specifically those folks and then 
pulling in resources. We need more tap mentors. We need, you know, there. You, you, men- you mentioned earlier that you know we're having shortages on Title One campuses with you know those instructional specialists and supports. Those types of resources are short everywhere, right? So anywhere we can get additional mentoring support, additional support for aids and other things that um, the campuses need. Um, you know, certainly we would want to do that, and we're going to have to continue to provide those resources. Okay. Can you define the TAP mentor for us? I'm going to ask Ms. Hubbard to define that a little better than I could. Um, so a TAP mentor is an experienced teacher that kind of um, applies to, to become a, a teacher mentor. Um, and they go through a series of, of learning to become a mentor. There's also a, a scope and sequence that they're kind of given. You know, when you think about a brand new baby teacher, first thing you're trying to get them to do is what? Manage the classroom, right? Routines, procedures, those things. So the TAP mentor, they, they, that's what they're working on with them at the very beginning. So kind of details the milestones that they're going to be working with their mentor with, and they do receive a stipend for being a a TAP mentor. Okay, and those TAP mentors, do they also have their own classrooms that they're managing? Yes, they they are teachers of record. Ms. Williams' point, she said, we need more, right? We need more. So, um, um, Ms. Martinez, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but I think we are opening up that opportunity. I have signed up to be a TAP mentor. So um, it's kind of an all hands on deck right now, but I think Ms. Martinez can speak to that a little bit more. Yes, we have um, decided very recently um, with the knowledge that we don't have enough mentors or TAP mentors available. Um, So we've opened that up to central office, those who are qualified and certified to serve as a mentor to teachers and are available, you know, we're a bit shorter staffed than we, we used to be, but um, reaching out to our all of our central office folks and even some, you know, trying to rally up the campuses and the teachers on campus to serve in that support role so that we can get some strong mentors for our instructional apprentices and then, of course, beef up our TAP mentorship program too. And the TAP, uh, I don't know if you said this or not, but it stands for Teachers Advancing Professional Practices. And I don't know if we said that out loud or not. That's what TAP means, just so we're always using our acronyms. I wanted you to know what that means. No, that's fantastic. Can you also share what is that stipend? I believe I, I believe it's $1,500 a year. Right? Yeah, we can follow up with yeah, you Yeah, we can that. follow up to be sure. Okay, so for any teachers out there listening or if you know someone who could be a TAP, go tap on their shoulder and let them know it would be an extra $1,500 We'll, 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 confer, we'll confirm that. Okay, well, they're going to check on the math. Yeah. We, we want to make sure we're not advertising the wrong stipend. <laughs> and, and there's specific criteria. So, okay, how about this? Can we check on the math and could communications please... Uh, Recruit them? Yes, yes, put out a piece that has the accurate information. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's actually six hundred dollars for the year. So sorry oh, about that. Oh, I'm this. sorry. I was, I was trying to give him a raise. <laughs> see. <laughs> okay, and then how many? T- so a, a help just for clarity's sake too. So a tap mentor could be down the hall from you, right? And they're doing their own classroom. And then when do they go and and provide these supports to these apprentice baby teachers? She's she she. Got it planned. <laughs> um, um, so a TAP mentor, um, sometimes they're doing this work during their, their conference period, right? Because a, a stipend is uh, duties outside of, right, your your assigned role. Sometimes it's after school, checking in on them. Um, they will go in and observe a teacher and give them feedback. So that's all part, uh, part of the program. But um, our TAP mentors, they, they will carry a full teaching load. All right, so we appreciate that for, for TAP mentors, but I'd also like if y'all would please consider retired teachers who could ded- dedicate going from teacher to teacher during the class day. When I say teacher to teacher, I mean the apprentice teachers that we're all talking about. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malone. Ms. Jones, you have a extra question? Quick question about the TAP mentors. So... 
before everybody started in the pool, are there any requirements uh, to become a TAP mentor? Because I know I found I find it mentorship on a content level is easier because you have the data, you have that experienced teacher with that instructional apprentice. How is that? Yeah, how are they paired? How yes, ma'am. They, they need to be certified in the same content area. Okay. And so I'd like to be able to provide a thorough follow-up for you all on our TAP mentors and other mentors and um, where we may be short and what those qualifications and the criteria are so that you all will be well-informed. Okay. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Martinez, for that. So can we come back to our agenda item? Let's vote on this agenda item. I move the board to approve. Are we, are we ready? We already did. Oh. It, it's just been a while, so we're probably, an probably for, it's been an hour. <laughs> let's, let's vote on this. Um, can, we, can we vote? Yeah, we are voting now. Thank you. Motion passes 7 0. Can I have a motion for agenda item 12G? I move the board to approve consent agenda item 12G as presented. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Gilliam, second by Mr. Hamilton. Do we have a discussion? Yes, Ms. Day, thank you. Um, I would. Um, move to amend the motion for the House Bill 3 resolution by adding the words uh, to page 2, number 2, adding the words, the aforementioned, preceding the word available. We have a motion by Ms. Hannon, and then we have sec a second. second by Dr. Gilliam. Do we have a discussion? I think, I think we are just changing adding one word to clarify what does that mean by armed personnel. Is that correct? That, that's correct. We're adding two words. The, words. the aforementioned preceding the word available. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this is the discussion we already had earlier. Um, seeing no discussion, let's vote. Yeah, so the motion passes 7-0. Now we need to vote on the motion with the amendment. Please vote again on the, this time mm -hmm. we're voting on the original motion with the amendment. Motion passes 7 0. So now we're moving to the agenda item 12. M. I move the board to approve. Ten. Sorry. Are we Go ready? Ahead. Yes. I move the board to approve consent agenda item 12 M as presented. 12. Second. Sorry. I'm sorry, 12, 12 M 10 as presented. Second. We have a motion by Dr. Gilliam, second by Ms. Hannon. Do we have a discussion? I will start the discussion since I don't see any other uh, requ you know, requests. So I will start the discussion. First, I wanted, I wanted to up thank everyone for providing all the information. And especially, I requested for the RFQ uh, from 2013 and 2018. So I just, wanna, I just wanna clarify for the RFQ 2018, we did send the RFQ, but we, for the 2013, we didn't send out the RFQ. But for the 2018, we did send the RFQ, but we didn't contact any other vendor, is that correct? Because the, the, the list for the other vendor was zero. He said not available.
Thank you, Ms. Gay, for answering the question. So in, in 2013, the, the, there wasn't an RFQ specifically for long-range planning. Yeah. There, it was for a capital improvement plan that included how we were going to do boundary changes and, and things like that. And so uh, the organization, which was De Jong, De, De, De Jong and uh, Richter, they were a partner with Jacobs Engineering that won the award uh, for uh, for that contract. And so the 2018, though, did we send it? Because I, I do see the, the document you sent it over. Is that, it looks like RFQ, but... For 2018, looks, we did issue an RFQ specifically for... For the long-range for the long planning. Range planning. But, yes, but then the question is, there is no other vendor responded to it. Because on that co column, it said, mm -hmm. you know... Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So this area is basically what you would call a niche area. It doesn't have a whole lot of competition in it. And what we've noticed over time is that a lot of these companies are buying each other out to form other companies. And so a lot of you see a lot of the same employees under a different company. It's just because they got bought out or they moved to that company uh, because of, of capacity and ability and capability of the company. And the last, last thing I wanted to um, make a comment because I, so I, thank you for, for sending over the bios from the company. And um, so I, I, I really, I read every single bio. It looks like this firm, they mainly work with Round the Rock, Austin, ISD, and Brian, uh, ISD, and there's probably two, I mean, there's two gentlemen or three uh, people worked with Forban IC in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but, and so that's, but they, looks like they have never worked with other school district around us, like in Forban, like Lamar or Katie, I mean, Katie, uh, I don't see any, like, experience mm -hmm. with is that correct? I just want to confirm. You'll notice that on their bios, they have like an asterisk by some of them, which indicates that they worked on that particular school district with another company and not necessarily the company that they're working with right now. So they are, they are telling us what their experiences are and everything. They just haven't been in the, in the local area. And we did provide the board with a, a matrix of, of, who other districts are using for similar type work. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it is what it is. Okay. Um, thank you for the answer. Ms. Malone, do you have some questions? Yes. I, I mean, y'all, I've already really heard where I was at um, before, but I think with some of the new information, one of the, the challenges for me was, which I don't have this matrix right here, but for example, the points they were awarded for working with Fort Bend ISD in the past. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand. Now, granted, I wasn't serving on the um, the committee for that, but I don't get how they were awarded the points for working with us previously when the, the firm itself hadn't. Is it just by nature of the individuals who went from the company, the preceding company and contract that have now moved to this um, new entity? Is that how they were awarded points? Because typically from what I understood when we did our, our workshop, on, workshop on the evaluation and how the, these bids and contracts go, is they get the points based on their references. Mm -hmm. So if they, and that's one column, and then their history in working with Fort Bend, what I noticed on prior bids is many entities are, um, maybe didn't get points because they hadn't worked with us previously. But what's, what I find interesting is that this time, this entity got full points from working with Fort Bend ISD and having a history because of the individuals, whereas it's not the same thing at, let's say, some construction companies where it might be individuals who went from one firm to another or architects. Because... Again, um, these pools of talent, they do often move around. So I'm trying to understand the logic on that one. 
So when we're looking at a vendor's past relationship with the district, we take into consideration several things. So like, for example, we take in past projects or contracts for similar service vendor uh, has had with the district, past projects and contracts for similar service uh, services the vendor has had with any K-12 district uh, of similar size or larger or past projects or contracts for similar services vendor has had with any business or universities the size of our district. So it's not just necessarily experience with Fort Bend ISD because you would never have new vendors that would come into the area or the market who had never worked with Fort Bend ever have a chance to work. So we take into consideration previous work with other similar sized districts or universities and, and businesses. Okay, so is, that's then applicable on all bids? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, and then, so actually the gentleman spoke about that earlier, this earlier, and I found this rather interesting as well. Um, from my own little research, mm -hmm. Does this entity, speaking of experience with long-range planning, how many, how much experience aside from these folks who are so here? Okay, so these these people who have now moved to this company, they've now got this new depth of knowledge, and they're changing into this market or adding this vertical market within their their scope of business. What happens if they leave tomorrow? So what I saw in there were, were the bios, and I did notice that a few of those folks had worked for firms that we worked, we've worked with as a district previously. Mm -hmm. Typically, there's also a contingency plan in these bids, and I didn't, I mean, granted, I'm not, I didn't see the whole bid. I only saw these little um, bio pieces that y'all sent us. My, I'm just going to share my concern. Mm -hmm. When I saw the points allocated for historical work with Fort Bend or let's say other other districts, as a layperson going online and looking, just like as a layperson I did the other week when I quickly pulled up the bid to, to understand the time frame that it took for us, um, the biggest concern I have is that the entities itself in that line of work that they do seem as though they're in the construction business and not necessarily in the long range boundary planning. While I appreciate um, their movements into that market, I mean, I admired it. I, I love the risk taker as a business person myself. I'm like, hats off to you. You're going forward into a new market and I, I mm -hmm. give them kudos. Now, as, as somebody who represents the district and who has this duty, my question that I have is their history with doing this line of work, and I wasn't able to, to locate that. Mm -hmm. And if these individuals leave, what's the contingency? We're talking about a five-year agreement to the tune of $900,000. So, for, for us, so... and and. When we're under contract, you know, we're all in. And yes, if they breach the contract or let's say they don't render services and we're not happy, we can get out. But let me just tell you back to the whole 2018, I don't want to go through that again. That we don't want to have to go through the point of non-performance. And then, yes, we could get out of the agreement with non-performance, surely. Um I don't know. I'm, for me, board, I guess what I'm saying is I have a lot of red flags that I'm concerned. So HBM is a, is a subsidiary of a holding company, which is Hoare Construction, H-O-A-R. Um, they've been in the business since 1997. Um, they, have a, they have a good reputation. Their references checked out. When you look at what their actual past experience, the points – awarded were only five points out of 100, uh, but all of their other references checked out and their reputation and what they've done for other school districts of similar size. Uh, their, their proposal was, was very well done, and, and I would think that companies lose people all the time, just like school districts and other corporations and everything, people move on, and so we would expect the 
a staff member of similar caliber or similar capability would replace that people. We have the same issue when we hire architects and engineers. Uh, you know, when we hire other consultants for professional development or for any other thing that we do, there's the possibility that staff will change, and then we just have to deal with that change as it occurs. Oh, mistake. Thank you <laughs> for your, you know, opinion on that, and I get it. There's, there's risk that comes with the territory. I guess for myself, I don't, I don't want to take the risk. Thank you, Ms. Malone. So I just want to, I just want to bring attention the this to the um to the board's attention i i just saw this um on the dais i really noticed a lot of school district they don't really have a long range planning services is that correct mr gay it's it's as i explained earlier a lot of times it's rolled up into what they call a capital improvement plan yeah. or program that they do and so a lot of times it's architects and engineers that do that kind of work but in, in the case of, of like with uh, HPM, when they were doing it earlier as another company, they partnered with an engineering firm to do that capital improvement program because they brought to the table those boundary planning skills and, and those types of things that an engineering company wouldn't normally have. So they form a partnership, a subcontractor relationship, if you will, and they put a proposal in to, to say this is how we're going to handle that. And so we hired... Jacobs Engineering to do it in 2013. Uh, at that time, they were DeJong and, and uh, Richter, and then they became um, cooperative um, strategies. And then now, a lot of the people that were with cooperative strategies in the 2018 uh, year have left to go to HPM. So that's why you see a lot of the same people yeah. uh, emerging in those companies. Thank you for that. But um, I just, okay, that's, that's, clarify certain things, but also on this paper, I, I do see a lot of district, they work directly with PASA. Mm -hmm. um, and then so that's also a, looks like it's an option. Pa PASA is our is the vendor that you've approved yes. their contract tonight for, they're going to be that's doing right. the demographic uh, work for us. Uh, they did not uh, they did not turn in a proposal. No, I, I don't mean for the long range planning because, for example, here Katie listed here, they are working with PASA, but I there is no separate long range planning service with another company. I just want to see that's also an approach to me when I look at this. Looks like that's also a possible solution. Working, you know, that's what those district are doing. Looks like. Um, so basically, I, I remember last time we were we asked, there is no urgent or pressing um, boundary changes or big changes ahead, right ahead of us. There's maybe um, student, you know, kind of overflow, but there's, I don't believe we have, at this moment, we have a big plan to, to do any boundary changes. Um, I'm very hesitant to to prove this item actually i i can't approve this item i mean vote to support this i i, I also wanted to clarify it doesn't mean um i don't support or respect the staff recommendation or expertise i do but but sometimes it's just some some things i just have to vote based on my conscience. I think that's why we have the board, because otherwise if we just vote on everything you recommend, then we don't really actually need the board. So that being said, I, I want to, there is no more um, questions or comments, or actually Ms. Hannon just pop up. So Ms. Hannon. I just wanted, I, I wanted to add that, that anything dealing with boundaries is going to be very messy and going to be, um, maybe not go as smoothly as we hope. Um, and, and I did look at the website of this particular company, but I also looked at the website of the other company that put up for bid and noticed that they, this is a new name because their website has a completely different name all through the text that hasn't been edited. Right. So it, it, I think that your your comment earlier about companies are buying other companies or, you know, restructuring or whatever it is they're doing and in a and in a you know niche area 
You go where you get the paycheck, right? And so this is the, this this is a challenging vote, um, but I would. Our staff has recommended that they believe that they need someone to help with long term planning, long range planning, in addition to what PASA does for us as the demographer. And so I I, I hear Miss Malone and I hear Miss Day. But I would stress to my trustees that we got two bids. PASA did not want to bid on this portion right. of, of what was put out there. And so, so my fear is that, you know, if our district really we don't have um, the staff that has the bandwidth to do this, um, and we don't get a single bid when it's put back out, where are we? And so uh, that was hypothetical. You didn't have to answer that, um, Mr. Gay. So anyway, I, I would just ask the board to consider that um, perspective before we vote. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hannon. Ms. Malone. Thank you, President Day. So a couple questions in this peppy um all right so you mentioned all of the change and the turnover mm -hmm. so why five years if it's such a volatile market and there's so much change and inconsistency why long term why a long-term agreement if tomorrow is not guaranteed why not a two-year agreement or why isn't it a two-year agreement with three one-year renewals why is it a five-year agreement on a volatile industry? Well, tomorrow's never guaranteed. And when normally what we do is we do do a two-year or a three-year with, within one-year options uh, figured in. So it's not, but we need the board to approve all of the whole of the contract so that we can negotiate with the vendor what, whatever they would prefer to do. And then when the option years do occur, it's just an administrative function in the purchasing office. So that's what we can do. So let me know, I guess, on the RFP, what is the agreement for? Yeah. I, know. Yeah. I thought it was a five-year agreement. It, it is, but it's, it's, it's a three-year three term with two one-year options, so that makes five. Okay, so it's a three-year. So I guess this is where I'm at. I, as Ms. Day mentioned, or President Day, excuse me. Oh, no, I'm fine. Um, there's no super urgent pressing thing. The last bid took one month and four days mm -hmm. to get the bid from opening to closing of the bid. If we did need to fast track and there was something emergent that that's roughly 14 days, mm -hmm. a little bit more, we'll say. And I don't think this community would ever handle changing boundaries in 30 days that this takes us a long time to do um, boundary planning. So I don't see the urgency as well. I'd prefer a shorter, I'd prefer a shorter um, contract, especially knowing that you've shared how volatile this industry is and how much change and turnover there has been and consolidation um, and new companies and restructure, restructuring, et cetera. And then what I would ask and this is the, the last ask is how many vendors, since it's a short list and we know the short list, was every company who provides these services sent an invitation email asking them to participate in this bid? If they're registered in our system, they received an invitation. And we sent out, I think, over, over 1,000 invitations went out. 34 companies pulled down the RFP from online. And then we received two proposals. So you said how many how many companies it went out to? Over a thousand. So over a thousand, but there aren't a thousand long range planning no, but, companies. But we have to send it so, out to any vendor that's expressed an interest in that category. Right. So we we track everything by commodity code. So do we do do we do it only based on what's in bond bonfire, or we do it based on what's in the CMBL? I'm sorry. So is it based only in bonfire these vendors? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So what if we expanded the pool 
to the statewide pool of vendors who provide these services. Well, we, we do we do we do check this we do advertise in this on the state's uh, website and, and on, on bonfire we, we don't do. mean advertise I mean directly email well that's that's really all you can do on the state side is you can you can go in there and post your bid and then an email goes out saying that the bid has been posted to anybody who's registered on the state side well if uh, this is just me I think a couple things the bid was done in July July is like the worst time to get bids because people are on vacations and we already discussed last time how you went to the conference and how um, all of these entities, you know, de are determining whether or not to bid or not on projects because of the cost to do the bid, the amount of time mm -hmm. it takes, all of that, right? Um, plus during the summer months, summer months are really difficult to get bids back because Frankly, people have lives, just like with the district, the district shuts down for a week in July. So do other companies. Um, I, I'm just saying to the board that I, I, I have some concerns and same thing with the vote with your conscience. That's what I'll do as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I really do appreciate all of y'all's work through this. And I understand. And I know you wish you could just get 100 bids back and you know pull from there but it is it is what it is it's a unique time we're in thank you okay. thank you miss malone dr gilliam i'm gonna tag along or piggyback on what miss hannon said and she said she didn't want that answer okay so what happens if we don't get if we do this again and we don't get the two bids then we'd have to go back out again You'd have to go out until you have some kind of bid, or then we could look at other alternatives. There, uh, there could be an interlocal agreement with another school district. So, like, for example, we're members of the Central Texas uh, Purchasing Alliance, which has 175 school districts that have all come together and said we'll share contracts with each other. So we could look at some of the contracts that, are, that have been done. I know, for example, HISD is piggybacking off of CyFair's contract and using their vendor, which is PASA. So we could use other vendors that have already been contracted by another district. We could go out to a cooperative such as the Buy Board or Choice Partners or Omnia Partners and see what they have out there to see if there's a vendor that we could utilize there. Uh, like I said, if we go out again for another one, that's just going to delay the time frame that we have to bring a vendor in to work with PASA to do the work for boundary changes that are scheduled to occur in 2024 and 2025. Um, so, you know, but we would, we would make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gilliam. I don't see any other questions, comments. I just want to thank everyone. I, I think everyone has the best intention, in all the board members and also the staff. And I just, the, the only thing I want to say is, yes, PASA, I, I do say PASA on and thank you very much for clarifying that. So basically, people can can temporarily use the service with PASA provided. And also, I just feel the this board, like we really try. We, we really try what we believe is the best. So that being said, let's vote. Motion field five two. Thank you, everyone. And I, I again I want to thank you, staff, for all the work. And now um, we will now come in in closed session under Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter five five one, under the following sections. Section 551071, for the purpose of a private consultation with the board attorney on any or all subjects or matters authorized by law. 
Section 551072 consider purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. Section 551074 personnel matters. Section 551076 security matters. Section 551082 student discipline matter or complaint. Or Section 551021 personally identifiable information about public school student. The time right now is 10:03, and we are now coming the enclosed session. 10.35 p.m. And we are now coming, reconvening in open session. We don't have, oh, we don't have any action item from closed session, but we, we are going to move on to the next agenda item. Next agenda item is 16 action item. Can I have a motion for 16A? Yes, Madam President, I move to approve item 16A as presented. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Malone, second by Mr. Hamilton. Do we have a discussion? Seeing none, vote. She's not here. What? Yeah, because she's Miss Hamilton. Motion passes 6-0. Next item, 16B. Yes, Madam President, I move to approve item 16B as presented. Um, actually, we have a motion language. Can we, um, Ms. Jones, I believe you have the motion language. Yes. Can I, you please make a motion? I move the board authorize Fort Bend ISD Board of Trustees to evaluate proposals for the Internal Audit Services RFQ. I want to clarify that. Uh, wait, we need, a, we need a second. I second. We have a motion by Ms. Jones. We have second by Dr. Gilliam. Do we have discussion? Quick discussion. Ms. Jones. I want to clarify that the full board will be involved in the program. Mr. Garcia, do you want to answer that question? That is correct. Okay. That's what the motion is for. All right. And I just also wanted to clarify that the questions that were asked in a previous item on the instructional apprentices will be posted on my Facebook page for the public as well. So let's vote. Thank you, Ms. Jones. I don't see any other questions. Let's vote. Yes. Motion passes 6 0. We have a last uh, action item 16 C. Um, I'm going to pull that item because I believe the board needs more time to get it ready to vote. So, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> that was quick. So, the time is 10.30 a.m. and we are now adjourned.